Can you hear me? I can. Thank you, Alina. Okay. okay, great. Okay. All right, I think we're good to go. Uh, so, uh, I think we're ready. I think we have the board members. So for those on the, please remember to mute your phones and your computers. Folks, hear me? Yes, but there's an echo, John. Okay, there's a serious echo. My screen. It's frozen, I think. Can folks? Yeah, we still can still hear me? you, John. Yeah, okay. we can still hear well, you. Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. Uh, my screen has seemed to be frozen right now, so uh, I'm glad that folks can hear me. And I just want to welcome everyone to the August 26, 2000. 20 Wildlife Conservation Board. Uh, we'll start out with the roll call, and then I would, what I would like to do is go over some meeting logistics to help not only the board members, but then also the members of the public who have graciously joined us this morning. So with that, uh, Chuck, do you want to add any opening comments at this point? Yeah, I would, John. So those that can see me, my name is Chuck Bonham. I'm the chair of the board and also the director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the first couple of things I would say are a deep appreciation for everyone who made time to join today. Collectively, we're kind of living the democracy experience through these technology platforms. Just last week, I had two days in a row of eight plus hours of public hearing through these platforms. And for it to work well, we really all just need a measure of patience with the 160 folks that are on the phone. We're going to invariably have echo feedback. Babies may yell. Dogs may run across the screen. There will be moments where it's hard to understand the verbal cues and we talk over each other. <laughs> We're probably going to experience people saying, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? And that's just a little bit of the kind of baseline experience. And the way I found we make it through is if we just relax and give everybody space to participate in the public process, knowing these platforms have some glitches. So that's point one, John. What really helps is if each of us could be diligent about looking at the icons on our screen or our phone and always being on mute unless you're talking. And also it helps if you're not talking, go off your video feed. Um, the next thing I'd just say is a big thanks to each of you. I hope all of you are safe and healthy at this moment living through a global pandemic. So we thank you and we thank the frontline folks dealing with the coronavirus. We also have on our minds the Californians affected by the pandemic and by our current spate of wildfires and our frontline folks fighting the fires and the pandemics. So I'm gonna flip it back to John. I think we have roll call. We probably have some technology advice from John and then we'll get into how we structure the agenda uh, and then we'll get moving. Thanks, y'all. Great, thank you, Chuck. Uh, okay, I'll uh, perform the roll call now. So, Chuck Quantum. 
I'm here. Alina Bookday. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm here. Gail Miller, representing the Department of Finance. Uh, Diane Colborn. Here. Mary Creesman. Here. Fran Pavley. Here. Eric Sklar. Here. Okay. Uh, for our legislative advisory member representatives, uh, representing Senator Borges, Megan D'Souza. Uh, representing Senator Skinner, Katrina Robinson. Representing Senator Stern, Catherine Moore. I'm here. Assembly Member Friedman, Jim Metropolis. I'm here. Uh, Edward, Assembly Member Eduardo Garcia, Keith Chalino. Here. And Assembly Member Lamone, Michelle Sevilla. Here. Great. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Uh, so uh, what I would like to do now is just go over some meeting logistics just to help Chuck kind of set the groundwork of the virtual world and platforms that we're all working within uh, in today's world. Uh, and just uh, start out, the meeting is being conducted via Microsoft Teams platform. There is an opportunity you can either log on through the Microsoft Teams and or through your cell phone using the information that was uh, sent out in the agenda. And then we also posted the information to our website. Uh, I would like to reiterate that please keep your device muted until such time as you are called upon or willing to speak. That really helps the virtual platform function. <laughs> The way it's supposed to. For those using the telephone system and through your cell phones, you can access the presentation that you'll be seeing that will be presented today through the Wildlife Conservation Board website. By doing that, go to the website, go to the meetings tab, and pull down the presentation for today, and you're free to follow along. The format of the meeting uh, is to complete the first few agenda items then go to the consent agenda and then take questions and comments from the board members, if any, and then take public comment, if any, uh, and then a subsequent motion. And the way we'll do the motions, uh, because we're on a virtual platform, I will read the motion and then we'll, we'll do a roll call vote by the members, the voting members of the board. We will then move into the presentation calendar and that starts at item number 19. The way it'll work is I will introduce the project and notice any letters of support or opposition and then introduce the Wildlife Conservation Board staff who will provide a brief overview of the project and give a short presentation. At the end of the presentation, I will ask for board member comments and or questions and then ask for public comments. However, if any board member during the presentation has any question or needs clarification on anything that was mentioned, you know, please speak up. We're happy to answer the board member questions at that time. Uh, for public comments, for any member of the public making comments, please state your name and affiliation if you have one. And then the order of the public comment that we're going to roll out today is we've asked folks to submit in advance speaker cards. So we have several of those speaker cards that have been submitted and we will take those first. So they have the names, it'll go a little quicker. And then those using uh, the Teams platform and can see it, there is a function on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. It shows a little hand. You, you feel free to, uh, if you wish to speak and have not enter, uh, submitted a speaker card, use that hand function. And we have tech folks standing by to uh, monitor that. And then lastly, if you're on a cell phone and wish to make uh, comments, we will call upon you at the end of all the rest of the comments. Um, and the, it's really important today that your con, your comments and and the information you want to present to the board is concise. It's quick. Uh, we are going to put a limitation on the 
time you have to deliver comments today to the board. Normally we don't do that, but because of the volume of comments that we're expecting today uh, for several of the items, we're going to limit the speakers to three minutes each. And so I will be monitoring that time frame. And you know, don't. <laughs> uh, I hope you don't feel, uh, you know, taken out if I if I interrupt you after your three minutes is up. But please keep that in mind. Three minutes only. Uh, and then I would also like to ask the board if they're comfortable holding off with individual motions until the end of all the presentations, with the exceptions of items 19 and 23 in the presentation agenda. This is. This course is similar to the way we did it last time. We'll take uh, the consent items. We will uh, present any consent items that the board or I feel needs to be presented, and then we will take the consent package as one item, and then uh, the, all of the presentations, excluding 19 and 23, as one motion, and then we will take those individual motions uh, for 19 and 23 as the project comes up and is presented and discussed. However, if any board member wishes to condition the approval of a project or would prefer to have a roll call vote for any of particular item at any time, we, we can you can move the motion. We can complete a roll call vote and then we can move on to the next project. Lastly, the board will be adjourning into a closed session item at the end of the agenda. It's item number 34. Members will be joining or joining onto a different teams platform, a closed session platform for that item. And then once that uh, closed session is concluded, we will come back to the full public meeting on this Zoom site and then we will report out actions taken during that closed session. So is there any questions from the board members uh, on any of that process? All right, hearing none, uh, is there any questions or comments or if board members would like to make any opening comments, you know, this is a great time to do that. None, okay, moving on in the agenda. So this item is number two in the agenda. This is the opportunity for pub public comment uh, for items that are not on the agenda. Please remember that not on the agenda, whether it's a consent item or a presentation item, please hold your comments to those that are not on the agenda. Is there any member of the public wishing to speak? I did have one speaker card from George Haig. John, if I yes. could just quickly, having experienced this again, everybody, if you want to comment about an item which is on the agenda, not now. This this happens a lot. So this is the moment for public on anything else, not on the agenda. Just want to underscore that. Thanks. This is uh, Hello, George my name, Haig. My name is. This is George Haig, and I'm with the Marina Valley Group of the Sierra Club, the conservation chair, and I'm concerned about the. Uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife not doing their best to be litigating projects. Uh, the San Jacinto Wildlife Area is a very special place. The Audubon Society, Center for Biological Diversity, Friends of the Northern San Jacinto Valley and Sierra Club have all needed to litigate to try to protect this special area. We have worked for more than 25 years to do what we can to enhance the habitat, make sure it doesn't become an island surrounded by urbanization, Hunters and their conservation groups have do donated to our groups in order to follow through with litigation, such as on the 8,000 plus unit villages of Lakeview on the southern border of the San Jacinto Wildlife Area. We went in court more than five years ago, the latest version we lost, but it is now an appeal. Again, we would love to have Fish and Wildlife join us in these litigations. The 40 million square foot World Logistics Center is on the northern border of the San Jacinto Wildlife Area and would share a two mile border. It is again these groups that have litigated and won in court over the past five years, and we are still litigating 
the latest version of the World Logistics Center. We appreciate all the letters and testimonies from fish and wildlife on both draft and also on final EIRs. They made for better projects, but they also showed how the final EIRs could even be made better. Why has not the fish, your department litigated on their own? The wildlife area is so special. It needs your voice, your attorney's voice, even beyond the letters. We need you to step up and protect these and other special lands with litigation. Without environmental groups, the southern border of the wildlife area would already have huge destruction on its border, and same thing along the two-mile border on, on the north end. An urban park is not what we want the wildlife area to become. You have spent more than $80 million of public funding, funds. We also need to work to pull together the two disjointed units with some type of linkage. These are all things that I wish the Wildlife Conservation Board and others would direct the Department of Fish and Wildlife to become involved in these litigations and not just rely on the environmental communities with the help of the hunters. I thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mr. Haig. Is there any other public comments? Yes, Kent Sawaski, uh, I wish to apologize for speaking over the top of the prior person. Uh, again, you said there are difficulties with the technology and I was unmuted and I apologize. Uh, I have some of the similar concerns of the prior speaker. Um, I'm a concerned citizen and I'm a self-proclaimed public funds watchdog and I did risk wish to request that uh, coming from the center of the Emerald Triangle in Humboldt County, uh, that Fish and Wildlife do everything it can to support our local representatives up here, such as Scott Bauer and other people who through litigation or whatever necessary to protect our environment. Unfortunately, in Humboldt County, we have a board of supervisors that in most of our, a lot of our opinions, uh, puts uh, taxation and greed over the protection of our valuable resources up here. So I would like to see our local uh, people regarding the cannabis business give support to and staff and funding and litigation potential to our local fish and wildlife who are basically ignored on many of our projects up here that come before them when they make objections. So thank you for my opportunity to have input on what I feel is Mother Nature's arc up here up in the Northern California in the middle of the Humboldt, uh, Humboldt County in the middle of the Emerald Triangle. Great, thank you. Any other public comment? Great, hearing none, we'll move on to item number three in the agenda. This is information that we put out in each agenda package. It describes uh, our current funding status and our capital outlay and local assistance funding that's available. Information is represented in the original uh, appropriation through the budget process. And we align projects that are uh, on this agenda. And then we show all of the projects that, and the amounts for those projects that are currently in development with uh, internally in WCB. And then we present a projected and allocated balance. It shows all of the bond funds uh, that we have currently the general fund, the greenhouse gas reduction funding, and then we summarize that at the end with a total of all funds. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if the board members has any. Okay, hearing none. Uh, moving on to item number four, this is the executive director's report item. Uh, I want to just point out two quick items uh, today. I know I want to be brief because of the size of the meeting that we currently have, but there is uh, a couple of things that I want to highlight for board members. Uh, and I just Chuck spoke on it in his opening comments. And I just want to say, uh, you know, I hope that you all are staying well and safe. Uh, you know, the COVID pandemic has affected WCV. From a work perspective, we are continuing to telework. Uh, you know, our, our whole office is working, teleworking in one capacity or another. Uh, we do have staff going in on occasion to move mail along, to sign documents, those kinds of things. 
But, you know, I think from looking at our last meeting, looking at today's meeting, I don't think WCB staff has lost step by teleworking. I think they've been doing a fantastic job. Uh, we keep the we keep moving projects through. We are working a lot with our grantees and providing the flexibility that's necessary during this time. So we're looking at grant extensions and doing those when necessary and when it's called for. The other thing from the COVID perspective, and I just want to shout out and get on the record, and I want to thank two individual WCB staff members. That's Lloyd Warble and Justin Gonzalez. Uh, back in April, they were two of WCB staff that stepped up and became contact tracers for the state of California. They offered their time and commitment to do that. And I think that's uh, honorable on their behalf. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to those two staff. Uh, the last thing uh, at our November meeting, uh, staff will be providing a report and a presentation on uh, meeting the strategic plan objectives and goals over this last year. We'll be doing a formal presentation to the board, and so just be looking forward to that. Uh, that's all I have right now for a, a director's report. If you have any questions, board members, you know, please ask me. Okay, hearing none, going into the consent calendar. Yes, uh, I would like John, to this is Mary. Yes. Um, take the minute to get off mute. Uh, apologies for the delay there. Thank you for that update. Um, and I just want to echo the thanks for staff. It's really tough to keep functioning in a moment where there's so much turbulence. Um, and it's hard, and I just know that that makes our work so much more important. Um, especially as we're being impacted by all of these climate impacts in this moment. And just want to appreciate you and the team for keeping things moving and keeping the eye on the prize of what we need to do and how important our mission is. Um, yeah, just really want to appreciate and, and share that. I'm sure everybody, all staff, have, have things going on in their personal life, family members who are impacted, whether it's from the climate chaos or from the economic um, crisis we're dealing with or the public health crisis and juggling all of that and the realities of all that with needing to really continue in this mission um, is a lot. And so just appreciate your leadership, your team's leadership in moving that forward. Um, and I, you know, you and I talked a little bit earlier this week um, and I don't wanna take time on this call because I know we have so much to go through that's important but I would love on at a future meeting um, to have a little bit of a discussion about uh, the wildfires. And I know your team is thinking about previous projects impacted, um, projects we're considering and, and where they may be impacted. Um, how, what's our role? How do we, how do we think about uh, our work around conservation in connection to, I know we've done some restoration projects in the past. Um, but what does it look like? Where are the opportunities from, you know, making sure that folks who are applying to money are using best practices on, on landscape resiliency to um, thinking about uh, where are the needs for our, you know, maybe an increased um, focus on, on restoration integrated into some of our work. Um, just want to flag that for, I'd love to have a conversation at, at uh, a meeting coming up soon that we can just hear from your team on how we're thinking about that and and maybe take a moment to kind of say, are there other ways we should be thinking about this um, to play, um, continue to play and maybe expand our role as um, an agency that's really pushing around solutions. Um, so we just want to flag that for a future meeting. And thank you again to the team for just amazing work in this tough time. Great. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, we are thinking about that at the staff level. Uh, you know, this, the current set of fires, we are reviewing uh, maps, fire maps. You know, we're comparing those with existing maps that we have in our uh, database. And so, yes, we'll be happy to, you know, have a, a discussion at November if the board members are okay with that and uh, we're able to pull that together. Any other board member comments?
Great. Seeing none. OK, we're moving on to the consent calendar. And there is one item uh, on the consent calendar that I would like to have presented, and that's item number six. Uh, I feel it's appropriate and uh, would probably be in the board's best interest to get uh, information or information. So I will ask that item number six be presented. Uh, so with that, uh, the consent calendar would cons consist of items five, six and eight through 18. If, yeah, it's item number seven that I will be uh, having presented. So item consent items five, six, eight through 18. Is there any board member comments, questions on any of those items? No, but I would move approval. Second. Okay, that was- uh, Gail Miller. Moved by Gail and seconded by Diane. Fran. No. Fran. Happen. All right. Um, great. Uh, we do have one speaker card from a public member that would like to speak on uh, item number six. Uh, Mr. George Hay. And remember, uh, keep your comments to three minutes, please. Hello, this is George Haig again, um, Conservation Chair of the Moreno Valley Group of the Sierra Club. I was looking at the uh, WCB Strategic Plan Update 2019 uh, through 2024. It reads as follows, the, work, the WCB protects restores and enhances California's spectacular natural resources for wildlife, for public use and enjoyment. In partnership with conservation groups, government agencies, and the people of California. It goes on, WCB envisions a future in which California wildlife, biodiversity, and wild places are effectively conserved for the benefit of present and future generations. WCB protects WCB projects and programs maximize return on taxpayers' investment in conservation and wildlife-oriented recreation and empower and inspire and future generations to protect precious habitat and wildlife in California. Recently, the um, department approved the final EIR for the Santa Santa Wildlife Areas Land Management Plan PEIR. For two years, the Sierra Club and other groups have requested being able to give comments to the final EIR. And yet, and the week prior to this happening, uh, this approval and the issuance of the notice of determination, um, I sent at least four or five emails to several people who are connected to this approval. In my opinion, they should be ashamed of themselves. The public and other agencies have a right, in my opinion, to look at the final EIR, even though we gave input in the draft EIR, significant differences are now in the final EIR that we would have liked to have made comments with the idea that the final document would even be better than the one that has currently been approved. There are PhDs, you know, wildlife biologists, all of these people wanted to give input, and yet they were denied to do this. We always appreciate the Fish and Wildlife giving input on other projects, final EIRs. It always makes for a better project. And I'm sure the Fish and Wildlife people also understand the importance of them giving input on other projects, final EIRs, and the importance of that in developing a better project. We all, I also very quickly want to express the need for us to maintain the maximum amount of water at the Santa Santa Wildlife Area and not degrade the amount of water that the Eastern Municipal Water District will provide. I agree that's up for negotiations, but why would you cut back on the water just to allow Eastern Municipal Water District to sell it to private interests at a much higher price? 
Sure, it may save the department a few dollars, but at the expense of being able to maximize the land that we have for wildlife biological values. You also need to connect the two different disjointed parts, 10,000 acres each, and yet they are separated. Okay, you Mr. Haig, you, you need to start finishing up, please. Uh, your three minutes are past, sorry. Hey, I thank you very much, and you all have a good and safe day. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other? Is there a board member comments? Yeah, John, I, I raised raise my hand in the chat function. Okay. So I would just say on behalf of the department, I appreciate George joining to make that point. The consent item was a update about the department's work because this board has heard before criticism about the department's delay and the long time frame to produce the environmental document. So George, I, I appreciate the feedback. I would underscore the EAR is a programmatic document. Any individual project uh, related to the land management plan needs its own um, you know, planning documentation platform. I do think if you look at the document, you can see a pretty exhaustive response to comments section, which is appropriate. We think we did provide the appropriate moments for engagement and I would just end by saying I concur with George that some of the subsequent items uh, related to this property are really important like ensuring sufficient water and dealing with um, you know the local water supply pressure in a way that secures fish and wildlife conservation so that is on my own our radar, so to speak, and I appreciate you taking the time, George, to weigh in. Great, thank you, Chuck. Any other board member comments? Okay, we do have a motion on uh, the consent calendar, items five, six, eight through 18, uh, made by Gail, seconded by Fran. Uh, so if the board members are ready, I will read the motion and then we'll take a roll call vote. So staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board adopt the written findings and approve all individual projects identified by staff as suitable for funding up to the amounts listed for each and listed as con consent calendar items five through 18, excluding item number seven as identified in the Wildlife Conservation Board final meeting agenda dated August 26, 2020. Authorize staff to enter into appropriate agreements as necessary to accomplish these projects and authorize staff in the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to proceed substantially as planned. So with that, uh, Alina Bokde. Aye. Chuck Bonham. Aye. Diane Colborn. Aye. Barry Creaseman. Aye. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. Brian Pavley. Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. Great, thank you. Okay, with that, we'll have a short presentation of item number seven on the agenda. This is to consider a grant to uh, Humboldt Bay Park Rec Harbor District uh, up in Humboldt County. John Walsh on our staff will present the project this morning. Can you hear me okay, John? I can. Okay. Uh, this project involves a grant to, for the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands property, also known as Dog Ranch. The property is located in the community of Samoa on the north side of Humboldt Bay in Humboldt County. The property is bounded on the west by one mile Pacific Ocean coastline and on the east by Humboldt Bay. The city of Eureka lies across Humboldt Bay. Next slide, please. This project is a rare coastal access opportunity and consists of 81 acres of wetland consisting of nine acres of scrub shrub wetlands, 56 acres of forested wetlands, and 16 acres of emergent wetlands and mudflats. 
Next slide. Uh, the wetland, riparian, and forested areas provide connectivity between habitat types on the north spit where several rare, threatened, endangered, and protected species are known to occur. Some of the species include the western snowy plover, little willow flycatcher, beech leia, Menzies wallflower, Humboldt bay wallflower, California red-legged frog, and peregrine falcon. Next slide, please. A large stretch of the dunes occurs throughout the western extent of the property. These dunes include seasonal dune swales, which are typical of dune complexes on the coast of Northern California. They provide wildlife habitat and groundwater recharge. Next slide, please. The mature coastal coniferous forest in the property's uplands are characterized by Sitka spruce trees, beech pines, and stands of Douglas fir. The beech pine Sitka spruce stands are uncommon along the Southern Oregon and Northern California coast and are considered rare in California. Next slide, please. The grantee is the Harbor District and the successor grantee is the Friends of the Dunes. Friends of the Dunes will be an interim holder of the property until it can be transferred to BLM. A cooperative management MOU is being established for resource protection on the property. It involves the following partners, Friends of the Dunes, CDFW, BLM, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Humboldt County Sheriff's Office, Humboldt Bay Harbor District, and State Coastal Conservancy. Friends of the Dunes is establishing a separate cooperative stewardship and traditional access agreement for the property with the Wiat Tribe. Next slide, please. Once protected, the property will add to nearly 1,300 acres of contiguous publicly protected dunes along a three mile stretch of the coast. If conservation doesn't happen, rare coastal resources become further endangered and safe and appropriate public recreation is locked out. Detrimental uh, camping and dumping continues and development may occur. Staff recommends approval as proposed in the audience. We have uh, Mike Zipra, Executive Director of the Friends of the Dunes, Adam Wegshaw from the Humboldt Bay Harbor District, Gordon Lepig, Senior Environmental Scientist, Supervisor, CDFW, Mike Van Haddam, Senior Environmental Scientist, Specialist, CDFW, and Michael Bone, uh, State Coastal Conservancy. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, just for the record, I do want to let the board know and the public know the letters of support and opposition that we received uh, on this project. So we received letters of support from Mike Wilson, Supervisor, Humboldt County, Virginia Bass, Supervisor, Humboldt County, uh, Jennifer Savage, Surfrider Foundation, Juan Hal Marino, Audubon, California, David Jacobson, Environmental California, Susan Jordan, California Coastal Protection Network, Andrea Leon Grossman, Azul. And then also from Jesse uh, Misha with the Surfrider Foundation, and also from the Sierra Club and Red, the Redwood Chapter. And then also from Jennifer Colt, the director of the Humboldt Baykeeper, and Ted Hernandez, uh, and Adam Cantor from the Weat Tribe, the Table Bluff Reservation. We have received two letters of opposition, one from Yuri Driscoll, uh, and the other from Richard Tobin. So does the board members have any questions? All right, hearing none, uh, we do have uh, two speaker cards that was submitted for this project. Uh, actually, several speaker cards. Uh, on, uh, so Virginia Bass, Humboldt County Supervisor. And if you are speaking, don't forget to unmute. Okay, I don't know if she was able to make it on. Uh, we'll go to the next, Mike Cipra, Executive Director of Friends of the Dunes. Hi, I'm here. <clears throat> Good morning, Good. board and staff of the Wildlife Conservation Board. My name is Mike Cipra. I'm the Executive Director of Friends of the Dunes, the successor grantee for the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Conservation Project. 
Friends of the Dunes is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're dedicated to conserving the natural diversity of coastal environments in Northern California through community supported education and stewardship programs. We enjoy broad support in the Northern California communities where we work with more than a thousand members, donors, volunteers, and supporters. I had to figure out this other system. As a land trust, Friends of the Dunes currently manages 122 acres of coastal dunes for habitat conservation, restoration, and appropriate public access. The Wildlife Conservation Board funded the purchase of 44 acres of this conservation land. Thank you. For the last 20 years prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Friends of the Dunes has provided free outdoor environmental education programs to thousands of Humboldt County students, educating and inspiring the next generation of stewards. During this time, we've also trained, supervised, and empowered hundreds of community volunteers to conduct native dune habitat restoration. We believe that by working in cooperation with our community and with our partners, we can steward Northern California's remarkable coastal dunes and provide a better future for native plants, wildlife, and people. The Samoa Dunes and Wetlands Project represents an incredible conservation opportunity. This property includes sweeping open dunes, a Sitka spruce and shore pine coastal dune forest that is the furthest southern extent of this forest type on the U.S. West Coast, prime habitat for threatened and endangered species, and abundant wetlands. I want to recognize the leadership of the Wildlife Conservation Board, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the California State Coastal Conservancy for championing this landmark conservation acquisition. We at Friends of the Dunes came to this conservation project relatively recently when we learned that the Humboldt Bay Harbor District was no longer willing or able to serve as the interim conservation landowner. This amazing conservation deal was likely to fall apart without a qualified conservation landowner to serve in this role as interim landowner. Friends of the Dunes does not take this responsibility of stewarding the property lightly. This is why we are developing a memorandum of understanding for the cooperative management of the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands property with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Humboldt County, the California Coastal Conservancy, and the Humboldt Bay Harbor District. This MOU outlines the commitments of all partners to the effective protection of natural and cultural resources of the Samoa Dunes property, and the MOU is currently being circulated for approval of our partners. In addition, Friends of the Dunes is working on completing a management plan for the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands property with the California State Coastal Conservancy to ensure the state's interests in conservation are protected. Friends of the Dunes is developing a separate agreement directly with the Weah tribe to provide for cultural access and cooperative management with the tribe. We think it's really important to make space at this meeting to recognize that this conservation project is on ancestral Weah land. Friends of the Dunes does not see our organization as the long-term landowner and land manager of this property. You need we to... are the interim conservation landowner, and we are currently working with all of our partners uh, including BLM, CDFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the State Coastal Conservancy. Okay, you need to catch County. your comments off, please. Your three minutes are up. But okay. Just finish up if you would, please. I I thank the Wildlife Conservation Board for your support, and I'm open to any questions the board may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Virginia Bass, Humboldt County Supervisor, District 4. I hate to say this, but can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. New system for me. So thank you very much, well, for your patience, first of all, but um, for definitely for considering this item today. I'd like to support my, uh, voice my support for the project as it happens to be in one of the most beautiful areas of our county. And of course, I'm kind of biased. I've had the good fortune of representing that general area for about 10 years now and the stunning views and the amazing dunes still, um, you know, amaze me to this day. It's the best place to go at the end of a day when you just need to realize that there's a lot of beauty in this world. This project um, specifically has been like years in the making and I'm really excited to see it moving forward. It's taken tremendous coordination between multiple private and public partners and uh, the path hasn't always been easy. That's why I'm really glad to see us here because it brought a lot of people together to the table and um, that's when good things happen. In my opinion, the property has tremendous conservation value, and the project itself represents um, a great benefit for Humboldt County, and actually, quite frankly, all Californians. Friends of the Dune, as I think you probably are aware, has a strong track record and commitment to managing coastal dunes for habitat um, conservation, as well as um, public access, and I believe they'll be excellent stewards of this land. 
and I appreciate the fact that the Harbor District were able to bring these guys to the table, and I think it's a really good fit. So please do support staff recommendations. And lastly, I do want to say thank you to the Wildlife Conservation Board. I know you've invested a lot of money in Humboldt County conservation over the years, and we truly appreciate that, and I'm certainly hoping you will add this project to your list. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Yuri Driscoll. He was opposed. Yuri? Don't forget to unmute yourself. All right, I don't hear Yuri. Uh, what about Rich Tobin? Rich Tobin is here. Great. Please proceed. Remember three three minutes, please. I can do that. Uh, first of all, I say I was not opposed to this. I did not mark my card opposed, and I emailed confirming that this land needs to be protected. I don't know a lot about the grant world and how it works. And my issue my issue is not about Friends of the Dunes. I have and the, I believe I have and the public's right to participate in the process that resulted in the grant before you today uh, was not adequate. I've received documents provided by the Conservation Board's board and I've reviewed them. None of the agreements, none of the agreements, even the one that has signed by two people already, states that anybody else will receive this property after Friends of the Dunes. It's not in any document. The document you will find that is a memorandum, draft memorandum of understanding that is now being prepared that Mr. Sipper referred to. A memorandum of understanding is not a legal enforceable document. Okay? My problem was with the Harbor District, in the packets that I received from the Conservation District, were the agenda notices by the Harbor District. Those agendas stated that they would be negotiations between the Harbor District and the seller. That's all it said. Out of those closed sessions, there was nothing to report. The existence of the noticing of these here uh, of the negotiations must be put out because it was a re legal retirement requirement to do so. The agenda before their last meeting included Friends of the Dunes for the first time. When the board reviews the documents that are before them, not mine, the ones that are before them, they will find. They will find that one. But your documents will also show that negotiations with Friends of the Dunes had been going on before. They showed up at the meeting, the Harbor District did, with documents ready to sign, and they approved them at that time. There's no way the public had knowledge, noted, noted knowledge, that Friends of the Dunes was negotiating with this contract. I have no problem with them negotiating. It was a failure to notify the public. I was not able to present any evidence. Okay. Okay, Mr. Dovin, you need to finish up your comments. Okay. I hope I sent documents to each board member. I hope that your intellectual curiosity is piqued. And when you discuss this meeting today, you'll consider the items that I have presented. There is no change between the document that I sent you and the executed document that I received yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Driscoll, are you able to get on or were you able to get on? 
All right, we'll move on to Adam Wagaskal, Humboldt Bay Harbor District. Uh, thank you. I'm Adam Wagshall. I'm the Deputy Director with the Humboldt Bay Harbor District. I'll be really brief. I just wanted to, um, on behalf of the district, you know, relay our support for this project and the um, important conservation that will result from it. And really thank the Wildlife Conservation Board and, and so many partners that we've been engaged with um, to make this happen. It's, it's really taken a lot of people, a lot of thought and a lot of effort to get to this point. Um, so thank you. And um, I just want you to know I'm here to answer any questions that come up. That's all. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, moving on to Stephen Williams. Hello, my name is Stephen Williams and I'm the Senior Vice President of Real Estate with Security National Properties, the current owners of the Dog Ranch. I'll be brief as well. I'm here just more or less to state my support as well and thank you for all the multiple organizations that have been working on this for quite some time. Um, I'm also here to answer any questions from the property owner representative side if they happen to come up. Great, thank you. Uh, Yuri Driscoll. All right, uh, Kenny Carswell. Hi, I'm Kenny Carswell. I'm leasing and operations with Security National Properties. Uh, also keep mine brief. Um, just here to support this, um, just kind of shine light on the fact that the Friends of the Dunes, we, in our opinion, are very credible and capable land stewards. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their time, and I'm also here just to answer any questions that may arise. Great, thank you. Uh, Tim Callison. <clears throat> yes, uh, I'm Tim Callison. I also uh, work for Security National and then part of this uh, project. I would like to give my support to this project, but uh, also would like to give a shout out for the professionalism that uh, we have been lucky enough to deal with within uh, uh, Michael Van Haddam, uh, Michael Bowen, Michael Cipra, uh, Sue Corbelet, you know, and I'm sure there's a few others I'm missing, but uh, this has been, uh, you know, professional from one end to the other. Um, very impressed. And uh, anyway, uh, Security National is here as a team uh, to answer anything uh, that may came, come up. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, Yuri Driscoll. All right. Uh, so, that's all for folks who have submitted speaker cards. There's anyone on the in the chat room that has raised their hand. This is Supervisor Mike Wilson. I have not raised my hand because I can't see where to do that, but I did try and submit a speaker card uh, that came in through an email and I, I guess I get I guess it didn't work. All right, please go. All right. Hello, my name is Mike Wilson. I am a Humboldt County Supervisor for the 3rd District, which uh, also uh, encompasses this project site. Am I getting feedback? I want a little bit. A little bit. Hmm. I'll turn down my volume, maybe. That'll help. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also um, uh, the governor's appointment to the Coastal Commission for the counties of Humboldt, uh, Del Norte, and Mendocino County. I also sat on the Humboldt Bay Harbor Recreation and Conservation District for about 10 years, as well as on the board of Friends of the Dunes for 10 years uh, as well. So I have an intimate knowledge of, the, of, of all of these agencies, and I want to say that they have an amazing track record uh, uh, for putting projects like this together and moving or helping us move um, important uh, resource lands uh, into public ownership and, and, and important public management. Uh, this aligns with the objectives um, that all of our agencies are moving forward with, including yours. And uh, I want to speak to uh, also Friends of the Dunes as, a, as a, an amazing organization in our community. Uh, not only do they have a visitor center and, and educational programs and have done management of lands themselves, have partnered with all of our public agencies to do uh, uh, these types of transfers as as well. So this is part of their track record in, the, in this regard. And uh, I would say it's impeccable. 
Um, so I just want to thank uh, your board for the strong commitment that you have um, in terms of the conservation values and the results that have come from that in Humboldt County. I mean, we are one of the most beautiful and wonderful places to live, and it is it is no uh, and your uh, participation in that has been uh, has been great. And I have to say, your staff has done an amazing job, and I hope that you support uh, their recommendation. Thank you for this time to speak. Great, thank you, Supervisor. So, is there any other public comment? Uh, John, anybody on the phone? Yuri raised his hand, so I believe he's on the app now. All right, great, Yuri. Please unmute yourself. You may need to hit star six to unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Kent Sawatsky. If you're still waiting for your eye, may I speak now? Please. Um, I spoke earlier. I am a concerned citizen and a self-appointed public funds watchdog. Um, the problem, this is a wonderful project. I mean, and I'm sure that you have three people for Security National and their question be, when do we get our $2.2 million check? And I'm sure that's all been lined up. But, you know, I do I do wish to, 99.9% um, .9 of this project I can support, but there is a great amount of angst. Me attending the meetings and Mike Wilson, Virginia Bass, and all these people know exactly who I am regarding process here. And the process was not transparent. And I think you failed to cross your T's and dot your I's in the process. The question I would ask that you ask the Harbor District is why won't they take the project? Uh, or Humboldt County asked Supervisor Bass or Supervisor Wilson, why won't they take the project? Um, if this ends up not ending up going where you say it's gonna go, and there's no guarantee I can find in the documents where it will, in my opinion, and I, I don't, ever threaten litigation, Virginia Bass and Mike Wilson. I make recommendations with consequences, and I, I, I've never sued anybody, but I do fund lawsuits, some of them which your supervisor's gonna tell you again. And But I just, I really would like to see this uh, guaranteed some way that this is not gonna come under the category of, of, of a misuse of public funds or public funds going to a non-public entity. Uh, whole long list of great people to do it maybe they can do it in conjunction or subcontract out to the friends of the dunes but your process hasn't been done correctly and i think you're leaving yourself open to problems here and i'd hate to see it because it's a wonderful project so i'm not going to speak anymore i'm just going to i've made my points regarding uh possibly misappropriation of public funds or misuse or misdirection and that's all i need for the record so thank you for the opportunity to speak today hopefully mr driscoll can get a hold of it and get through it was very difficult i got bumped in and out had to redial three or four times and i'm sure you're aware of that bye great thank you Mr. Discrell, are you on? All right. Uh, is there anyone else on the system who would like to make a comment? Lepi Gordon? Yep. That's correct. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Gordon Lepig, a senior environmental scientist supervisor with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife in Eureka, and I want to re-emphasize the biological significance of the project. It is a biodiversity hotspot of the highest order, with a large area of high-quality wildlife habitat contiguous with other protected lands uh, on adjacent parcels. It is habitat for numerous state and federally listed and otherwise sensitive species, including birds, bumblebees, amphibians, and plants. It has at least five sensitive natural communities, also known as rare plant, um, I'm sorry, uh, rare um, vegetation types that occur on the site, including dune mat, coastal dune, willow thickets, shore pine forest, and Sitka spruce forest. The Humboldt Bay, um, bird Observatory has documented nearly 300 bird species in very similar coastal forest just north of the site. So the great biological significance of the project is manifold and manifest. But I also want to emphasize that CDFW staff contacted the landowner's agent immediately upon discovering that the land was for sale. 
and working closely and collaboratively with this willing seller, the Coastal Conservancy, and many other stakeholders, we have assiduously sought to acquire and protect this land for habitat conservation, listed species recovery, future restoration opportunities, keeping common species common, and public access and enjoyment. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Lepig. All right. One last time for Yuri. Are you on? Okay. Uh, hearing no other comments, I would like to just make a couple comments. And I, you know, that we have heard a couple uh, concerns about public process and the lack of that process, but I just want to reiterate that this project did go through our normal WCB evaluation processes. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife did review an application package, uh, went through a scoring process. Uh, it came to the Wildlife Conservation Board with a recommendation to move forward. Uh, so it did have, uh, and that process, anyone is available to apply. Uh, so we went through that process. We went through the appropriate appraisal processes. We uh, published this uh, back meeting back in July, of which at that time this uh, item and this project was noticed at that time. And then we have provided the agenda uh, two weeks in advance for this item. And so I think there's plenty of public process that has been engaged in this. Uh, the other thing is my staff has worked uh, a lot of time with uh, the opponents on this and provided them information. Yuri? Yuri? Uh, and so, uh, you know, I am comfortable with the process that we went through. Uh, I'm satisfied with that. I think it's and stand any test. Uh, the other thing is our grant agreements normally do not identify future owners uh, unless they are specifically uh, a successor grantee that we know going into the transaction, then they are identified. What the grant agreement does do is provide the opportunity to, for the grantee to transfer ownership at some point in time. But that transfer needs approval of the Wildlife Conservation Board. So we will, have, if and when that uh, transfer happens, uh, we will approve that. So there are, you know, there's things in our grant agreement that protect us and make sure that, uh, you know, any future transfers are covered and are approved. And if the, if the approval process doesn't go the way the grant agreement lines it out, then there's potential breach of the grant agreement and there's remedies for the Wildlife Conservation Board to implement uh, to protect our interests. So uh, be happy to answer any board member questions if you have them. Chuck, it just looks like Yuri is on there now, but he's maybe still muted somehow. He's been trying to get in. We can see him, but we can't hear him. Yeah, I. Yeah, our can, tech folks can I, uh, am I uh, am I on now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you for uh, dealing with helping me deal with these technical difficulties. I don't normally have this kind of problem. Let me uh, just say that uh, this is an extremely beautiful property. I I know it quite well. I've I've ridden my horses, hiked around multiple times. Uh, over my 35 years, picked up trash, worked on on the trails, et cetera. The, um, uh, when the Harbor District first agreed, uh, they were unaware of some of the issues that were out there, the uh, kinetic sculpture raids, the, um, oh, just multiple issues, the homeless camps, uh, very extensive out there. And they decided against uh, taking it, which is unfortunate because I think that there's a way for them to do that um, and I was excited to have a public agency maintain that where there would be some public process involved. However, all of a sudden without notice as has been projected already, the um, 
the Harbor District somehow brought in the Friends of the Dunes, which is a private entity, and they were brought in uh, to negotiations in May uh, without notice. There's no public notice, as you can see from the agenda uh, I sent to you. And uh, so not until August 13th were, was anyone aware that they were involved in any negotiation, at least the public. Apparently, um, other people have been, were aware of this. Uh, so the lack of notice, I mean, that's a significant problem. Um, how they were brought in, why they were brought in, why there was no other request for proposals is really a problem. I could go on and on. There's the, the Harbor District Council that also works for the seller, the Harbor District Executive Director worked for Friends of the Dunes, current supervisor worked for Friends of the Dunes and was director um, a long time ago. So everyone else seemed to know that what was going on some of these people knew, but the public did not and did not have an opportunity to present some of the issues, the multiple of issues that are involved in this project. Um, what is missing is an existing management plan, which is in your packet is an identified existing management plan. There is none that the Friends of the Dunes have. They have one that is has was expired 10 years ago. Um, and there's also problems with the grant agreement um, with the conservation, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the conservancy. Our Horsemen's Association submitted a letter offering to negotiate with the district. That was back in July to help with maintenance and control, et cetera. We have a long history of working with state and federal local agencies for just this type of thing. Um, so we did not get a response from that letter back in July. We did not know that they were in negotiations with another nonprofit. Um, one more thing that I think is is kind of issue an issue is that the right after the you need August to finish 13th, up your comment, Mr. Driscoll. Okay, I'll do that. I I would like to recommend um, having the Harbor District agreeing to maintain and transfer to another public agency. Uh, some of the legal issues um, of gifting public funds would be avoided that way, and uh, the project objective of a public acquisition and management would be maintained. Um, handling handing okay. a public Please finish up. To a private Please entity finish up. Does I am doing that. The handing of public property to private hands does not accomplish the goal that was outlined in this project originally. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, is there any last board member comments? All right, hearing none, uh, I would recommend that the board move forward on this. And if you so choose, uh, you know, if I could get somebody to make a motion, uh, I'll read the motion into record. Let me take a vote. Do you need a motion, John? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I, this is Diane. I'll I'll move that. What, were we going to approve it, or do we we're going to vote on it? Yeah, what, end, yeah. We I'll, yeah. If we get a motion in a second, then I'll read the motion into the record, and then we can vote on it. Okay. All right. I'll move it. I'll second it, John Gale Miller. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the motion is: staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. Allocate $700,000 from Proposition 40, Public Resources Code Section 5096.6501 One for the grant to Humboldt Bay Harbor District, the Humboldt Harbor Recreation Conservation District, authorize staff to enter into appropriate agreements necessary to accomplish this project, and authorize staff and the department to proceed as planned. So with that, Alina, okay. Aye. Chuck Bonham. Aye. Diane Coborn. Aye. Barry Creasman. Aye. Gail Miller. 
Aye. Fran Pavley. Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. Great, thank you, board members. The motion passes. Okay, that takes care of our uh, first item. Uh, so now we'll move on to item 19, and I'd like to get the board's feeling about this. Uh, you know, there's several members of the public wishing to comment on this as well. Just like to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, should we just continue on in the agenda or should we move through the other projects first and then come back to this item? John, this is Alina. Um, do we have do we have other speaker cards for the other agenda items or? Uh, we have a few, not many at all. Uh, I mean, I yeah. you know I'm open, but I think if there are uh, just I mean I assume that there's a significant number of speaker cards for uh, item number nineteen. So if the Board is okay. We, you know, maybe uh, if there's a couple others that have a few speaker cards, we could run through those first and then get into the 19. But I um, again invite the board to weigh in on approach. Yeah. There's only four other projects that we've received speaker cards for. That's okay. not saying that some member of the public will want to speak during that item. But that's the number of projects. And of those four, there's one, two, uh, there's five folks that wishes to speak on those four projects. This, this is Diane. If I could just add, um, I could see the value in taking other projects first so that uh, lots of folks who are on the line um, for other projects don't have to you know wait for hours for their project to come up but I just want to make sure if we do that that we're leaving enough time for the um, I think probably lengthy discussion we're going to have about item number 19 and that everyone's got an opportunity to speak and board members to uh, ask their questions so whichever way you think will best ensure that I'm in favor of agreed I agree with your comment Diane yeah Okay. Uh, John, this is uh, Fran. If there's no uh, really opposition to the other items, I, I would suggest taking them first, and then we can really focus our attention on what could be a lengthy discussion on item 19. Okay. Any other board members? All right, well, let's do that. Uh, let's move on. We'll uh, come back to item number 19. Uh, let's move on to item number 20 in the agenda. So, John, this is Chuck. As we move to 20, just for everybody, you know, tuning in from home, we get a presentation from WCB staff, then we come back to the board for questions of staff, and then John will run us through whether anyone's a public speaker John will then read a motion. We'll need a second and a vote. And there's deliberation at the back half after public comment. Correct, John? Correct. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, with that, we'll go to item number 20. Uh, This is to consider a grant uh, to uh, Dave Oswick Canyon. Yeah, Dave Oswick Canyon. Yes. Jason Yee of our staff will present this project to the board. Jason. Uh, good morning. Uh, this project is to consider a WCB grant and a federal Section 6 subgrant to save Oswick Canyon to support their acquisition of 114 acre property located on the western boundary of the city of Palm Springs and approximately three miles southwest of their downtown area. The property is in an area known as Oswald Canyon, which is situated against the eastern slopes of the San Jacinto Mountains. The property is adjacent to and complements the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains Conservation Area, a designated conservation area within the Coachella Valley multi-species habitat conservation plan. Um, on the map, the project area is highlighted in red 
Thank Nearby you. protected areas include Santa Rosa, oh, San Jacinto Mountains I'm National sorry, Monument, and the CDFW behind. Santa Rosa you, Wildlife Area. Next slide, please. I'm married to Paul with I would I'm like to ask service. folks to mute their phones. Next slide, please. Let's keep talking, Jason. All right. Immediately to the west and south of the property is open space leading up to the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountain Ranges, while to the east and continuing north, a six mile area of residential and commercial properties occupies the landscape. Um, the undeveloped property is characterized by natural desert terrain associated with Sonoran creosote bush scrub, along with mixed woody habitat and succulent scrub habitat. The hillside topography contains moderate to severe upslope with nearby alluvial fans that descend from the higher elevations of the San Jacinto Mountains, supporting several ravines that move water across Oswald Canyon. Next slide, please. The federally endangered peninsular bighorn sheep inhabit the San Jacinto Mountains and have been historically recorded in Oswald Canyon. Alluvial fans provide forage for the sheep throughout the year. Unfortunately for the sheep, alluvial fans also represent some of the more desirable development areas Budding up to the mountains and having slightly higher, higher elevations, providing superior views. Within the Coachella Valley, most of the, of the alluvial fans areas have been impacted by development. Oswald Canyon contains the only remaining large undeveloped alluvial fan in the city that has not been conserved. Next slide, please. The current landowner has filed a proposed tentative map that would allow for development of 59 residential units but has agreed to sell the property for conservation. This acquisition would permanently protect the property, preventing future development and ha habitat fragmentation, while providing core habitat linkages and foraging corridors for the sheep. The sheep are endangered by widespread habitat loss. Conservation of habitat along urban wildlife interfaces is a high priority for bighorn sheep conservation. Along with bighorn sheep, this acquisition will benefit the federally endangered, federally threatened desert tortoise as well as at-risk species of Leconte's thrasher, gray vireo, and southern yellow bat. Next slide, please. Uh, with the support of volunteers and donations, Save Oswald Canyon will manage, monitor, and support the implementation of various restoration projects on the property. Property may be considered for future appropriate passive recreational uses. The Department of General Services has approved the fair market value of $7,150,000. Staff recommends that WCB approve this project as proposed, allocate $1,225,000 for the WCB grant and approval to subgrant $3,700,000 from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Habitat Conservation Plan Land Acquisition Grant. In the audience representing the Coachella Valley Mountains Conservancy are Jane Karpiak, Executive Director, and from Save Oswald Canyon, Jane Garrison, the President. Staff recommends approval of this project as proposed. Great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we have received a letter of support from Mr. Dan Silver, Executive Director of the Habitats League. Uh, and then, is there any board member comments or questions? All right, hearing none, we do have one speaker card for this. Ms. Jane Garrison, president of the Save Oswald Canyon. Remember to keep your comments to three minutes. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the Wildlife Conservation Board uh, for setting up this meeting when the pandemic started. We, we hope that this was going to go forward. This has been a very long journey for all of us in the city of Palm Springs. We began this journey almost five years ago when we realized that that land was threatened with development. Those of us who live in Palm Springs, we always thought it was protected because we saw the endangered bighorn sheep there on almost a daily basis. So we launched our campaign to protect this magical piece of land, which is not only home to the endangered bighorn sheep, but it's also lots of other wildlife and birds. We have such unwavering and enthusiastic support from the community. I wanted to be respectful of your time today, so I did ask the community to only have myself represent them. But I want you to know that behind me stands thousands of residents who are so excited about your consideration of this project. Our mayor, our city council member, our local wildlife agencies, our local biologists, the Bighorn Sheep Institute, and the local tribe. We are all so excited 
to see this piece of land protected, not just for all of the residents and visitors who come to Palm Springs, but more importantly, for the incredible wildlife that calls this land their home and their future generations that will be able to always call it home. So I thank so much CBMC for their hard work and the US Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I mostly, I thank you in advance for hopefully your support of this project. And I assure you that there is no one that's going to take care of this canyon better than Save Oswood Canyon and the residents who love and will protect this canyon. So thank you so much. Great, thank you. That's it for speakers. Is there anybody on the in the public uh, raising their hand or on the phone that would like to speak? Great, seeing none. I'd like to move approval if it's appropriate for a file item 20. Okay, uh, this is one where we'll take it as a package. Uh, okay. So items 20. Yeah, sorry. That's all right, 20 through 33, excluding item number 23 will be taken as one, unless the board, as we go through the projects, uh, want to do a separate and independent motion. So we'll move on to item 21, if the board is okay with that. Yep. Great. So item I mean, 21. John, yes. John, this is Alina. I, I guess maybe, you know, part of why we wanted to move these items up before uh, the 19 or item number 19 was to allow folks to get off the call. Um, so, uh, so if we're going to do it as a, a whole cohort of motions, then, um, you know, it might defeat that purpose in terms of um, people wanting to see the board's vote. So, I mean, I'm almost, although I agree with kind of the, the collective um, board motion, I think just so that people know the board's vote on this, I, I guess I would recommend that we just do these four uh, individually mm -hmm. so that the board can take a vote and allow mm -hmm. for those speakers to, to leave the meeting. Okay. I don't know if others agree or... Any other board member comments? Sounds reasonable. All right, so does somebody want to move this item? I think it was moved by Senator Pavley. Um, it was. And I'll I second can, it, Gail Miller. I can uh, do that again. Okay. Thank you. File item 20. All right, so let's take a roll call vote. Uh, Alina Bokday? Aye. Chuck Bonham? Aye. Diane Colborn? Aye. Mary Creaseman? Aye. Gail Miller? Aye. Fran Pavley? Aye. Eric Sklar? Aye. Great, thank you. Motion passes. Moving on to item number 21. This is to consider a grant to the American Rivers for a project up in Lassen County. Judah Grossman of our staff will provide a brief overview. Judah. Thank you, John, members of the board. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to American Rivers for a cooperative project with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to restore 140 acres of wet meadow habitat owned by Lassen National Forest located in the Pine Creek watershed and approximately 30 miles northwest of Susanville in Lassen County. This location map on the screen shows the project area relative to Eagle Lake to the east and the town of Susanville to the southeast. Next slide, please. Confluence Meadow, as its name suggests, is at the confluence of two creeks, Pine Creek and Little Harvey Creek. Pine Creek is the primary inflow for Eagle Lake which is the natural spawning habitat for the Eagle Lake rainbow trout, a subspecies of rainbow trout that is endemic to that lake. This oblique aerial photograph that you see is facing east, east um, and shows Pine Creek in the foreground flowing into Eagle Lake in the background. Next slide, please. This next fo photograph um, will face west away from Eagle Lake and it shows an unpaved access road on the left Pine Creek in the center and a tributary from Harvey Valley on the right. 
Confluence Meadow was historically overgrazed for decades, impacting its stream bank vegetation and stream bank uh, stability. You can notice the lack of branching along the Pine Creek Channel. That incised channel is now largely disconnected from its floodplain and that it does not flood even in a 100 year storm event. Next slide, please. This next photograph shows the incised and unstable bank along Pine Creek and Confluence Meadow. Nope, do we take a break from the presentation slides? There we go. Um, this photograph shows the incised and unstable bank along Pine Creek in Confluence Meadow. As a result of the creek's hydrologic disconnection from its floodplain, groundwater levels have dropped and wet meadow habitat has converted to upland habitat, as indicated by the encroaching sagebrush and upland plant visible along the banks of the creek shown here. The degraded state of this meadow impacts ecosystem services like water quality, water storage, wildlife habitat, and carbon sequestration, all of which affect Eagle Lake downstream and the associated Eagle Lake rainbow trout that spawn there. The conservation agreement for the Eagle Lake rainbow trout identified meadow restoration in the Pine Creek watershed as a crucial recovery action for the fish, and a watershed-wide prioritization of the degraded meadows identified confluence meadows, confluence meadow as the top priority for restoration. Next slide, please. The proposed project would re restore ecological processes in Confluence Meadow by filling the incised Pine Creek Channel to improve hydrologic fun function and floodplain connectivity. As a result of this restoration work, the project is expected to increase groundwater recharge, reestablish wet meadow conditions, enhance wildlife habitat, and improve water quality and reliability. Staff recommends the project as proposed. I'm happy to answer any questions that the board might have. And on the call today, we also have Maya Greenwood, Associate Director of California Conservation at American Rivers. Thank you. Great, thank you, Judah. Any board member comments? There is no speaker cards on this. Uh, is there any other members of the public wishing to speak? Seeing none, I'll call for a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve uh, agenda item 21 as staff recommends. Great. Second. Second. Great, so we'll call vote. Alina Bokde. Aye. Chuck Bonham. Aye. Diane Colborn. Aye. Mary Creesman. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. Fran Pavley. Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. Great. Thank you, Judah. Uh, Great, motion passes. You. Moving on to item number 22. Uh, this is to Aye. consider a grant to Trout Unlimited for a restoration fish passage project. Don Crocker on our staff will present the project. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> this proposal is to consider... You have a really bad connection. I do? Um, I'll get closer, I guess. How's that? Better yet. All right. I'll speak really loud. Hopefully that'll help. I, uh, I think that might be the problem. So don't speak real loud. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to Trout Unlimited for a cooperative project with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and private landowners to replace a culvert that is a total fish passage barrier where Appian Way crosses Nephis Gulch in Mendocino County. Next slide, please. Nephis Gulch is a tributary to the North Fork Navarro River in Mendocino County. Its watershed features low gradient perennial stream reaches that support listed coho salmon and steelhead trout. After being logged over 100 years ago, the area transitioned into ranching before becoming primarily occupied by rural residential homes like it is today. Next slide, please. In 2011, CDFW conducted a stream habitat survey on Nephis Gulch and identified the Appian Way culvert crossing as a total barrier to adult and juvenile salmonid migration. This is effectively eliminating salmonid habitat in one of the major tributaries on the North Fork of the Navarro River. This is an issue because the North Fork Navarro River and its tributaries are identified as a core area of recovery in the 2012 NOAA Recovery Plan for Central California Coast Coho Salmon, and the watershed was also identified in CDFG's 2004 Coho Salmon Recovery Plan as a key population to maintain or improve. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, when that slide shows up, it'll be you can see a picture of the problem. Um, this is the culvert where Appian Way crosses Nephis Gulch. You can see that the three foot plunge from the outlet that prevents salmon and steelhead from navigating further upstream. Next slide, please. I do apologize for the quality of this next photo, but I wanted you to see that even after a rain event that has significantly increased volume of water in the channel, the outlet pipe is still perched above the pool. Uh, next slide, please. The solution to this is an arch culvert with a 12 foot 10 inch span and an eight foot four inch rise. The culvert bottom will be placed three feet below the current channel and backfilled up to three feet thick with stream bed material to form a constructed channel. Once completed, the project will meet state and federal fish passage criteria and be able to convey a hundred year flood flow. Uh, next slide, please. Several large wood structures will also be installed downstream of the new culvert. These structures will provide channel grade control with the drop over each large wood structure kept at six inches to meet fish passage criteria. The horizontal spacing varies in order to avoid impacting existing trees adjacent to the channel, but these structures will keep the overall slope near 3%. Uh, next slide, please. When this, when this project is completed, the endangered coho and threatened stillhead will be able to access habit that has been unavailable for decades. The restoring of hydrological conditions will also benefit a number of amphibians like the red-bellied newt, California giant salmon, or coastal-tailed frog, and foothill yellow-legged yellow frog. And once the fish and amphibian populations begin to rebound, local predators will also benefit from a new food source. Therefore, staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. In the audience is Anna Halligan from Trout Unlimited. Thank you. Great, thank you, Don. Uh, I do want to point out for the record that we did receive a letter of support uh, for this project. Oops, that's the wrong project. I'm sorry. Uh, so is there any board member comments? Uh, we do have two speaker cards, Patty Madigan, Senior Conservation Program Manager for the, from the Mendocino County RCD. Uh, Mary Ann Payne. All right, is there any other members of the public wishing to speak? Any last board member questions and or comments? All right, uh, are you ready to make a motion? Move, move approval. I'll, I'll move. Second. Gail Miller. Great, so roll call vote. Alina Bokde. Aye. Chuck Bonham. Aye. Diana Colborn. Aye. Mary Creesman. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. Rand Pavley. Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. Great, thank you. Moving on to item number 23. Uh, this is to consider a allocation for a grant to the National Wildlife Federation for a cooperative project uh, with a lot of organizations for a great project. Uh, Don Crocker will also present this project to the board this morning. Uh, thank you again, John. Um, <clears throat> this proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the National Wildlife Federation for a cooperative project with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, California State Coastal Conservancy, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, and the National Park Service to build a wildlife overpass that will span the 101 freeway in Agora Road near the Liberty Canyon Road exit in Agora Hills, California. Uh, next slide, please. U.S. Highway 101 is one of the busiest freeways in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. 10 to 12 lanes wide at some points in northern Los Angeles County, it prevents movement of wildlife between two major wildlife habitat areas. The Santa Monica Mountains to the south and the Simi Hills to the north, which provide a pathway into the Los Padres National Forest. This habitat fragmentation and blocking of critical wildlife habitat linkages by the freeway has reduced genetic health and, and adaptability of many local species, but has had particularly dire consequences for mountain lions. Uh, next slide, please. Recent genetic analysis indicate that lions in the Santa Monica Mountains have among the lowest genetic diversity of any mountain lion population ever documented and are at risk of extinction in the Santa Monica Mountains within the next 50 years. Plans to restore connectivity across the 101 barrier set it on the Liberty Canyon Road area as it is the only site in the region that has protected land on both sides of the freeway. 
This led the, to the South Coast Missing Linkages Project, identifying the area as one of the highest priority linkages in Southern California. The area was also placed on CDFW statewide priority wildlife movement barrier list. And if this project seems familiar to you, it's because the WCB has also funded work to enhance the near, nearby Liberty Canyon Road underpass for wildlife movement in order to provide immediate relief from mountain lions looking across the Fourier array and help prepare their approaches for this project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, the next slide has a picture of a 3D model of the proposed overpass. The crossing will be 200 feet long and 160 feet wide and span 10 lanes of freeway and an access road. On an average day, over 300,000 cars will drive beneath the new structure. The former natural mountain slope that was cut into to build the freeway will be rebuilt in order to restore the natural flow up to the crossing. 500 feet of channelized stream and two acres of riparian woodland will also be restored that will work with landforms and sound walls to block the light and sound of the freeway that may, pre may prevent human averse species like the mountain lion from approaching the crossing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this next slide has a picture of an artist's conception of the finished overpass. I, I like this picture because you can see how this structure was designed to blend into with the area's topography. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this next slide has a, a closer look at the overpass itself, and the picture below it is what drivers will uh, artist's conception of what drivers will experience as they approach the overpass. Uh, next slide, please. This project is also notable for the public enthusiasm surrounding it. Years of public outreach by NWF and allies have raised awareness of the Southern California mountain lion. School children in LA County in particular have responded to this issue, as you can see from this photo taken at the Save LA Cougars rally. And local communities, the County Board of Supervisors, and state and federal agencies have all been involved to help propel this project along. This interest has also re reached Governor Newsom, who can be seen here touring the project site with Beth Pratt from um, NWF. Therefore, staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. In the audience is Beth Pratt from the National Wildlife Federation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Don. Uh, just for the record, uh, letters of support for this project. I received one letter from uh, Senator Stern, uh, Supervisor Sheila Kuehl with the 3rd District Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, Linda Thor Thor Mayor, City of Agora Hills, and Mr. Dan Silver, Executive Director of the Endangered Habitats League. Is there any board member comments or questions? John, we uh, should uh, ask Senator Donnelly, uh, this is Fran. I'm going to be abstaining on this project. OK, thank you. Because of a, um, a relationship with National Wildlife Federation, it's just an abundance of caution. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, John, this is Chuck. I would just say you know, on behalf of the department and I personally, I wish we'd done this project decades ago. The dynamic around saving these last best uh, apex predators is playing out in a lot of different venues, but this item here at the WCB is a definite must do, and I would make a motion. We approve the staff recommendation for item 23. I'll second it. Great, thank you. So we do have a motion and a second. Is there any other public comment? See and no speaker cards. Um, John, this is Catherine Moore. I would just, on behalf of Senator Stern, like to reiterate his support for the project and thank the board for its consideration. Very much appreciated, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, seeing no more comments or public comments, uh, we'll go to the roll call vote. Uh, so, uh, Lena Bokde? Aye. Chuck Bonham? Aye. Diane Colborn? Aye. Harry Priestman? Aye. Gail Miller? Aye. Fran Pavley? Oh, she's, uh, Fran is abstaining, sorry. And Eric Sklar? Aye. The motion does pass, Mr. Chairman. Hey, John, I'm sorry, but before you go on, uh, the, my grantee, Beth Pratt, has had a problem flagging you, and she just would like to say a real quick word, if that's possible. Okay, please, Beth. Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you to the entire Wildlife Conservation Board um, and Director Bonham for uh, your support of this landmark project. And it's true, I wish we had done it decades ago, but 
as you see, there's a lot of public support and partners that this is going to happen. And because of this grant, we are staying on track to break ground next year, and I'll look forward to celebrating with all of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. All right. That moves us on to item number 24. Uh, this is the Kings Beach Pier <laughs> Replacement and Recreational Access Project. Has to consider a grant uh, allocation to the California Department of State Parks and Recreation. Uh, Heather McIntyre on our staff will present you the project this morning. There. Thank, thank you, John, and good morning, board members. This proposal is to consider a $700,000 grant to the California State Parks for a cooperative planning project with the California Tahoe Conservancy. The Kings Beach State Recreational Area is located in downtown Kings Beach. The park is approximately one mile west of State Line and 13 miles southeast of Truckee in, in Placer County. Slide, please. Kings Beach is beautiful. The Kings Beach State Recreational Area includes nearly 1,000 feet of Lake Tahoe shoreline and about 14 acres of sandy beach and upland areas. It is an idyllic natural setting, a place for relaxation, play, wildlife viewing, and inspiration. Nearly 85,000 visitors come to Kings Beach annually to kayak, fish, and swim in the pristine waters of Lake Tahoe. Slide, please. I think we could all use a little Lake Tahoe time right about now. This planning project addresses the challenges of changing lake levels, climate change, accessibility, and increases in visitor use. The existing pier at Kings Beach is short, not ADA accessible, and is frequently out of water during low pool levels, which is exacerbated by drought. This project will provide the necessary planning to replace the existing pier and provide accessibility improvements to the pier, restroom, and throughout the site. Specifically, this project will be conducting field studies and surveys, updating the design, and preparing needed permits and construction documents. This project will complete planning and design for all updates and result in a shovel-ready project. Slide, please. This image is a general concept plan. The studies and surveys completed during planning will inform and update this plan. But ultimately, this planning project will prepare for a shovel-ready project that replaces and extends the existing pier, constructs a beach access ramp and staging area for non-motorized craft, expands the group and family picnic areas, and renovates the parking area. Slide, please. Staff recommends the board approve the Kings Beach Pier Replacement and Recreational Access Improvement Planning Project as proposed. Phil Tabor, a senior landscape architect from the State Parks Project Management Section is in the audience today and we will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Heather. Uh, just for the record, we did receive two letters of support, one from Mr. Patrick Wright, the Executive Director of the California Tahoe Conservancy, and Heidi Doyle, Executive Director of the Lake Tahoe Donner Sierra State Parks Foundation. With that, is there any board member comments and or questions? Staff? Hi, John, it's Alina. Um, I do have a question on the just the budget, the non-WCB funds. Are those other public funds or private funds that are matching for the planning um, grant? Um, Alina, the California Tahoe Conservancy is providing a significant portion of funds for the projects and State Parks is also contributing. Um, the California Tahoe Conservancy is contributing approximately $650,000 um, and State Parks $221,000. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, any other board member questions? We don't have any uh, speaker cards on this. Is there any member of the public wishing to speak either by raising their hand or jumping on? I don't hear or see any. Actually, it looks like um, there was, yeah. Yeah, yeah Phil, 
<laughs> Sorry, Heather. Sorry. This Phil <laughs> Tabor from Parks wants to. He rose his hand. Okay, Phil. Hi, good morning. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, so I'm Phil Tabor with California State Parks and also joined on the phone this morning with my co-worker, Sherry. Uh, very happy uh, to be speaking with you today regarding the grant funding for this project and do want to express appreciation for all Heather's efforts over the last few months, you know, getting to the agenda today. Uh, she's been great to work with. You know, this uh, funding request is going to provide great momentum towards the, the peer relocation outlined in the 2018 general plan and it does come as the second significant portion of funding. Um, we do we do have the CTC funding in place. Um, you know, this is uh, exciting to see the, the local community enjoying the improved water access and, you know, expanding the, you know, recreational opportunities beyond the shoreline, shoreline especially for um, as a lower income opportunity. Uh, State Parks team is is here as a resource if you have any additional questions today. So thank you. Great. Thank you for the comments. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, I would entertain a motion. So move. I'll second, Mr. Chair. Great. So roll call vote. Lena Book Day? Aye. Chuck Bonham? Aye. Diane Colborn? Aye. Mary Creesman? Aye. Gil Miller? Aye. Rand Pavley? Aye. Eric Sklar? Aye. Great. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank Moving you. on to item number 25, the Snake Marsh Restoration Project uh, in Sacramento County. This is to consider a grant to Ducks Unlimited. James Croft on our staff will present this project. James. Thank you, John. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to Ducks Unlimited Incorporated for a cooperative planning project with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to enhance wetland habitat on the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Kasumnas River Ecological Reserve. The reserve is located at the confluence of Badger Creek and Willow Creek, just south of the town of Elk Grove. The Kasumnas River Ecological Reserve was designated as an ecological reserve by the Fish and Game Commission in 2003 and supports numerous plant and animal species, including sandhill cranes, flycatchers, and warblers. The reserve habitats benefit from seasonal flooding of the Kasumnas River the only undammed river on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada. This flooding supports the reserve's diverse riparian and wetland habitats, including Snake Marsh. Next slide, please. Snake Marsh supports a unique population of giant garter snake, a federally and state threatened species, and one of only nine populations remaining in the state of California. The population which occurs within Snake Marsh is genetically distinct from other populations and would most likely be used for repopulation efforts within the San Joaquin Valley. This population has suffered significant declines during recent drought years due to reduction in surface water flows and the expansion of the invasive water primrose. Next slide, please. This planning project will complete planning activities to provide a long-term source of perennial water add infrastructure to improve water supply reliability, restore a complex of seasonal, semi-permanent, and permanent wetlands, and control invasive water primrose. These enhancements will increase emergent cover for giant garter snake and benefit other wetland-dependent species within the project area. Next slide, please. This project will include the development of engineering and restoration design plan, permit application, and environmental compliance documents. Additionally, the project will produce an adaptive management plan, monitoring plan, and complete baseline monitoring and cultural resource surveys. Next slide, please. Once restored, the habitat in Snake Marsh will provide stable, secure, high quality wetland habitat, which is essential to supporting the long-term success and expansion of this unique population of giant garter snake. Restoration of this wetland complex will allow the population to rebuild after a recent decline increase long-term body condition by providing a more stable and abundant prey base and help expand its range. 
Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as it proposed. In the audience today to answer any questions you may have is Mr. Aaron Will, Regional Biologist for Ducks Unlimited Incorporated. Thank you. Great, thank you, James. Um, we have received uh, one letter of support from Jim Cogswell, the Central Valley Coordinator for the Central Valley Joint Venture. We do not have any speaker cards on this at this time. Is there any board member comments and or questions on this particular item? Hearing none, Celeste, is there any hands raised and or other chat comments? No, there is not. Great, thank you. We'll take a motion on this project. I'll move it. It's Diane. A second, Chuck Bonham. Great. The roll call vote. Uh, Alina Bokde. Aye. Chuck Bonham. Aye. Diane Colborn. Aye. Mary Creesman. Aye. Neil Miller. Aye. Rand Pavley. Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. Great. Thank you. Great. Motion Thank passes. You. Motion passes. All right. Moving on to item number 26. This is to consider an allocation of a grant to the Nature Conservancy for a project on the LA River in Southern California for a stormwater capture project. Uh, James will also present this project to you. James. Thank you, John. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Nature Conservancy for a cooperative planning project with the California Department of Parks and Recreation to enhance habitat on the California State Parks Bowtie Parcel. Bowtie Parcel is located within the Glendale Narrows stretch of the Los Angeles River within Los Angeles City and County. Next slide, please. The Bowtie Parcel was previously part of Taylor Yard, a Southern Pacific Railroad Service railway station and classification yard. Southern Pacific closed the facilities in the late 1980s and California State Parks purchased the site in 2003 with the intention of turning the site into a public park. Due to lack of funding, Bowtie Parcel primarily remains a post-industrial landscape, partially covered with concrete, contaminated soil, and a mixture of native and invasive vegetation and wildlife. Currently, residents from nearby communities visit the Bowtie Parcel to walk their dogs, run, and bird watch. Next slide, please. The project will complete a suite of planning activities to ultimately daylight a storm drain and restore multiple habitat types within the project area, including arroyo, riparian, intermittent wetlands, and its coastal sage scrub. These restored habitats will enhance feeding, resting, and breeding opportunities for migratory birds such as Costas hummingbird and a suite of bird species prioritized for conservation by the Sonoran Migratory Bird Joint Venture. Next slide, please. The WCB funded portion of this planning project will include site assessments, geotechnical reports, soil contamination remediation planning, restoration designs, permitting, and community outreach. The work done for this project will inform future efforts throughout the region. Next slide, please. The completed project will result in multiple tangible environmental benefits, including enhanced wildlife habitat, increased biodiversity, improved water quality, and increased carbon sequestration. Completion of this restoration project will also increase the local community's access to green space. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. In the audience today to answer any questions you may have is Ms. Kelsey Jelsip, Urban Conservation Project Manager from the Nature Conservancy. Thank you. Great, thank you. And for the record, I do want to uh, point out we've received several letters of support for this project. Uh, Mr. Adam Schiff, Member of Congress, 28th District. Mr. Ria, Maria Durazo, California State Senator, 24th District. Wendy Carrillo, Assembly Member, 51st District. Hilda Solis, Supervisor, 1st District, Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Gary Garcetti, Mayor, City of Los Angeles. 
Sean Woods, Superintendent, Los Angeles Sector for California State Parks. Jennifer Dubernstein, PhD Coordinator for the Sonoran Joint Venture. Marissa Christensen, Executive Director, Friends of the Los Angeles River. Patricia Perez, Andy Voigt, and John Christian, Executive Committee of the Board of Directors for Los Angeles River Park State Safe Park Partners. Damon Nagami, Senior Attorney, Nature Program Director, Southern California Ecosystems Project, Natural Resources Defense Council. Elva Yanez, Director of Health and Equity, Prevention Institute. And Ms. Ruth Gallardo, Representative Green Blossom Design, Elysian Valley Slide Ride, Slow Ride. Uh, we do have one speaker card on this, but I would like to ask the board members if there's any questions and or comments at this point first. All right, seeing none, uh, Ms. Jane Garrison. Uh, she indicated a support. Are you able to get on? Last Jane, Jane, Jane spoke it for item 20, I believe. You spoke for Oswood, John. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then Ashley Kramer. Hi, that's me. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. I'll make this very brief. I'm a resident of Cypress Park, and I'm the chair of the Greater Cypress Park Neighborhood Council Land Use and Homelessness Committee. I wanted to say um, that I support this grant, absolutely, but I'd also like to say to the, um, the folks who are going to be running the project that there's a community of unhoused neighbors who live in the proposed project area and near the proposed project area. And so I would just ask that as part of your planning and analysis, you consider not only the habitat restoration, but also um, how that may displace some of our vulnerable members of our community and um, work through how um, the ultimate project might include resources to help rehome those individuals. Thank you. Great, thank you. Ashley. Uh, Kelsey Jessup, had your hand raised. Hi, yes, can you hear me okay? You can. Okay, great. Hi, thank you. I just, I wanted to say thank you so much to the board for considering our project. I'm Kelsey Jessup. I'm the project manager for urban conservation in California for the Nature Conservancy and the project manager for this project. And we're very excited about this project and the many benefits that it will provide for people and wildlife. I wanna acknowledge um, Ashley Kramer's comments as well. That's definitely something that we're considering and take that very seriously. So thank you for that comment. And I also just wanted to share, LA County is the birdiest county in the US. So there are more species of birds that have been recorded in LA County than any other county in the nation. And so this habitat will provide an important place for resident birds that will stay year round, as well as important stopover habitat for migrants moving through the area. And uh, riparian habitat, as you all are very familiar, has been compromised across California. And so this project is a way to enhance existing riparian habitat and to reestablish habitat that has been lost. I'm happy to answer any questions that come up now or later, and just want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak and for considering our project. Great, thank you, Kelsey. All right, any other comments? All right, so can I, are we ready to move it? John, this is Chuck. Uh, I'll make a motion and also just want to thank Ms. Kramer for her remarks about never forgetting the human dimension uh, when we're doing our mission work in regional landscape. So I appreciate Ms. Kramer raising that. So I'll make a motion, board approve staff recommendation for item number 26. Thank you, Jack. This is second. Alina, I'll second it. Great. All right, so Alina Bokday? Aye. Chuck Bonham? Aye. Diane Colborn? Aye. Mary Creesman? Aye. Gail Miller? 
Aye. Brad Pavley. Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. Great, thank you. Motion passes. Thank you, James. Thank you. Moving on to item number 27, the Tilton Ranch project. Uh, this is to consider a grant to the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency uh, for a cooperative project down in near Coyote Valley. Brian Gibson on our staff will provide the brief overview. Brian. Thank you, John. This proposal is to consider the allocation for grants of Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency, as well as the acceptance of two recovery land acquisition grants from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service and the subgrant of these federal funds. Tilton Ranch is located south central in South Central and incorporated Santa Clara County, adjacent to the city of Morgan Hill and west of Highway 101. Adjacent protected lands include the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority's 348-acre Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve for the Northwest and the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency's recently acquired 698-acre Bear Davidson acquisition immediately south of the property. Most of the remaining adjacent lands are residential small land and holdings to the north and the east with private land holdings to the south. At our May board meeting, the Wildlife Conservation Board approved funding for two nearby acquisitions, the 1,526 acre Coyote Ridge Expansion One property located about four miles southeast of San Jose and the 235 acre Sobrado South property located about 15 miles south of San Jose. Uh, next slide. The property is in the southern portion of Coyote Valley and is part of the wildlife corridor that allows animals to pass through the valley floor and foothills between the Santa Cruz Mountains and the Diablo Range. The Santa Clara Valley Habitat Conservation Plan Natural Community Conservation Plan adopted in 2013 states that linking the Santa Cruz Mountains and the Diablo Range uh, via the Santa Clara Valley is one of its main landscape level goals to ensure long-term protection of wildlife and rare and endangered species. Next slide, please. Hold on. I'm the property is currently used for cattle grazing, hay farming, and recreation with approximately six miles of unnamed seasonal tributary. The property provides suitable habitat for the California red-legged frog, the California tiger salamander, bay checker spot butterfly, tricolored blackbird, American badger, and burrowing owl. Next slide, please. The grasslands, riparian, aquatic, and oak woodland habitats on the property are of particular importance as they have exceptionally high wildlife values providing water, thermal cover, migration corridors, and diverse nesting and breeding opportunities for wildlife species. Next slide. The property will be available for future public use and provides an outstanding opportunity for recreation such as hiking, biking, and horseback riding on existing ranch roads and trails. Title to the property will initially be held by the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency. However, after a period of time and with the recordation of a conservation easement, title will be transferred to the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve the project as proposed. In the audience is Ed Sullivan. He's the executive officer of the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency. And Matt Freeman, he's the assistant general manager of the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great. John, this is Chuck. I have one question, and maybe it's best addressed to Matt. So, heads up, Matt. Just as of this morning, do we know whether this is an area that has burned in the uh, complex fires kind of down and around the South Bay? Yeah, I talked to Ed Sullivan, the executive officer, yesterday. We didn't actually talk about that subject, but he didn't bring it up. Maybe he'd like to speak on it. Sure, Brian. This is Edmund Sullivan, executive officer of the Habitat Agency. Um, no, uh, Chairman Bonham. Uh, uh, fortunately, no fires have impacted this property as of yet. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, we have no letters of support on this at this time. Uh, we do have due speaker cards. Ed Sullivan. Yes, uh, thank you, John. I um, guess I'll get on video here. So I would just like to thank the Wildlife Conservation Board for considering this. Um, I also like to thank John and his staff, in particular, John Walsh and Brian Gibson. 
I'd also like to thank all our funding partners. Uh, this was an expensive acquisition and it takes a village and we were able to get a lot of different funders and the funding coming from the state and the feds are as critical to making this happen. I'd also like to thank our board in um, supporting this and the, the patients they've had and also my staff. Uh, this took a long time to come together and the acquisition of this iconic uh, working uh, ranch will ensure its protection in perpetuity. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you, Ed. Uh, also, Matt Freeman. Thank you, John. Um, Edmund covered it well, along with your staff report. No additional comments, but thank you so much for your consideration of this outstanding multi-benefit conservation opportunity. Great, thank you, Matt. So is there any other members of the public wishing to speak at this time? Is there anybody in the queue, Celeste? I don't see any hands raised for Celeste. Okay, great. Uh, so is there any other board member comments and or questions? All right, I would like to entertain a motion. I'll move Mr. Chair Gail Miller. Second from Chuck. Great. Okay, roll call vote. Alina Bokday. Aye. Chuck Bonham. Aye. Diane Colborn. Aye. Larry Kreisman. Aye. Gail Miller. Aye. Rand Pavley. Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. Great, thank you. Board members, motion passes. John, um, this is Alina. I'm wondering uh, if in terms of the additional board items outside of item number 19, um, if there's any others that you have speaker cards on. If not, maybe I'd like to propose to uh, the board if we could go to item 19, um, just to be mindful of people's time so do you have okay. other items uh remaining that have one or two speakers uh otherwise maybe i'd like to propose to the board if we can move back to item 19. okay just on uh we just have one letter or speaker card on item number 32 that the hatchet bear mountain that's from the nature conservancy that's the project proponent so uh it's the only other one that we have a speaker card on at this time. Okay. So I don't know what the pleasure of the board is. Um, if we want to just listen, you know, have that one, that item move forward, the Tehachapi item move forward, and then go to item 19 or, or um, go to item 19, because I know I think uh, the project proponent is going to stay for item 19, so it might be okay to... I I'm okay with the vice president's suggestion. We do, I think you said 32, then we do 19, then we do the remaining, I guess, five. Okay. Yes, that would be great. Plus closed session. Yes. Okay. So is there any other, any concerns from board members? Or are you all okay with that? Hearing not so we're, we're doing item 19 or 32, I'm sorry. Let's do item 32 and then we'll go to item 19. Okay, great. So uh, item 32, this is to consider a grant to the Nature Conservancy to acquire uh, about 3,150 acres uh, down in Kern County. John Walsh on our staff will present this project and we'll need to adjust the presentation. So bear with uh, our technical staff to get us there. Can you hear me okay, John? I can. Okay. Uh, this project involves the grant to the Nature Conservancy or TNC to allow them to acquire in fee the Tehachapi Bear Mountain property. 
Uh, this slide shows the location of the property in relation to Bakersfield, State Route 99, and Sequoia National Forest. Bear Mountain you know, is just, located. Just a minute, up. John. Just we're trying to the slideshow is trying to catch up. Oh, that's that's a correct slide there. Okay. Just, uh, Bear Mountain is located about 24 miles southeast of Bakersfield in Kern County. Next slide, please. This slide uh, shows the subject property and TNC's nearby land holdings. TNC has worked on protecting 32,500 acres of land in the Tatchby linkage area to prevent habitat fragmentation and loss of connectivity. Next slide, please. In 2001, SC Wildlands produced a South Coast Missing Linkages Report. Today, TNC is updating the study to see if we have made progress and where improvements can be made. The Tehachapi linkage helps create a system of land protections and crossings. The Tehachapi uh, connection lies between the Sierra Nevada Cascades, Sierra Madres, and the Santa Ana uh, Palomar Ranges, and is also the juncture of several uh, ecoregions. This slide shows these linkages and illustrates how habitat connectivity is important for wildlife. Wildlife need open, unimpeded landscape to move for finding mates, locate food, escape threats such as fire and floods, and adapt to a changing environment. Next slide, please. Uh, one male mountain lion needs 40 to 80 miles of habitat. Because of severed corridors, Southern California now has six subpopulations of mountain lions. This acquisition will help connect the healthy population of mountain lions in the Sierra Nevada mountains and will assist in maintaining the linkage into the south and central coast ranges. Habitat connectivity is especially important in Southern California because of the growth in human population. Next slide, please. The system of passes and valleys separating the Tehachapi and Sierra Nevada mountains also provides the greatest connectivity opportunity for species occupying low-lying areas of the Central Valley and the Mojave Desert. Next slide, please. TNC will manage the property to support high elevation oak and coniferous forest habitats in this hot and dry region. Next slide, please. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has ongoing condor research in the area and in the past has expressed interest in locating a research uh, center in the vicinity of Bear Mountain. Following acquisition of the property, TNC will explore this opportunity with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The property will provide TNC with an excellent living laboratory to test and implement climate adaptation strategies. Uh, if climate change models predicting loss of coniferous forests in the region are accurate. Next slide, please. In summary, as we fix severed corridors, then in turn, we are able to reconnect populations of mountain lions, uh, deer, and other species and provide space for these species to move and they are less likely to interact with humans. This will also prevent inbreeding and disease within those populations. Uh, next slide. Staff recommends approval as proposed in the audience is Cara Lacey, Director of Connected Lands, TNC, Adrian Frediani, Project Manager, TNC, uh, Zach Principe, uh, Project Manager, TNC, and Bob Stafford, Supervising Environmental Scientist, uh, CDFW. Thank you. Great, thank you, John. Uh, is there any board member questions? Comments? All right, the one speaker card uh, that we did get from Kara Lacey, the Nature Conservancy. Kara? I think you're on mute. Hi, John, can you hear me okay? Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm on the, there we go. <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting feedback. Fine. Just wanted to say no, thank you. Sandy yes. Road. Sandy. Hello? Please make sure your phone's muted. I just wanted to say thank you um, and speak in support are you getting an echo? I apologize. No, I'm not. Oh, uh, I apologize. My name is Cara Lacey. I lead our Connected Lands program at the Nature Conservancy California. 
I just want to say thank you very much to the Wildlife Conservation Board for the ability to speak in favor of this great opportunity in the Tehachapi linkage today. And a special thanks to John Walsh for working so closely with us to bring this to you today. To date, we've preserved with your help over 40,000 acres, including Bear Mountain Ranch, which is before you today. And I think John covered everything really well. Bear Mountain, as he said, is crucial to climate adaptation and resiliency for multiple species. The property itself acts as a connector, connecting high elevation habitat with lower elevation habitats, and it's a critical component of the Tehachapi Mountains network. High elevation peaks or sky islands. Um, it is the northernmost peak or sky island in the Tehachapi Mountains as the range converges with the southern Sierra Nevada Mountains. So importantly and excitedly, this property also supports uh, seasonally occupied habitat for the endangered California condor, as John mentioned. And um, we're just very excited about this transaction and very thankful for your support. Again, our team is here to provide you with any answers to any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Kara. Any other board member comments? Questions? Any other members of the public? I see no hands raised. Okay. Uh, I'm ready for a motion if the board so chooses. I'll move approval on file item 32. I'll second it. Great. Thank you. We roll call vote. Alina Bokde? Aye. Jack Bonham? Aye. Diane Colborn? Aye. Mary Creesman? <clears throat> Come back to Mary Gale Miller? Aye. Fran Pavley? Aye. Eric Sklar. Aye. And Mary, are you able to get back or? I don't see Mary. We can come back to this vote uh, if she gets on, uh, but the motion does pass. Board members. John, it's Mary. All right. Aye. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, that takes us. Uh, to the end of our presentation projects where we have speaker cards, except for item number 19. And at the board's direction and request, we're going to go back to item number 19 right now. Uh, it's in the agenda. Uh, this project is to consider a, an exchange with the, by the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, with GDCIA, a property property owner down there and to also uh, the exchange of 219 acres with together with an additional 191 acre conservation easement uh, to go to the department. Uh, and I believe Chuck wants to make some opening comments. If That's right. Hey, thanks, John. So again, for everybody watching, my name is Chuck Bonham. I'm the director of the Department of Fish and Wildlife and a member of the Wildlife Conservation Board. Okay, so here's a couple of things that I want to mention to everybody. I think I would say, let's start with a deep breath. I realize item number 19 brings a lot of different voices to the agenda topic. As a matter of relationships, I've known most everyone who's involved, whether they are supportive or in opposition, who may express an opinion for quite some time. And of course, I've known each of you as board members for a while. So I just wanna talk about process for a minute. In a second, I'm gonna ask whether our vice president Alina would take the gavel just for this agenda item. So I think most everyone knows this, but almost every board meeting on many of the agenda items for decades, 
the Department of Fish and Wildlife has some role in the agenda item. And that makes sense. The 1947 Act creating the WCB put the WCB within the department. The department provides the board's enterprise infrastructure, payroll. Our department biologist, as you've already seen in each of the agenda items today, typically is interfacing. And at a technical level, among other things, the board actually effectively manages the real property portfolio of the department. Um, a lot of the folks who are both supporters and opponents today historically have a variety of agenda items before and I would expect in the future where the department is doing much of what it's done on this agenda item for those others. I have spent a lot of time thinking about the values of openness and candor and directness. I think it's important for me to always keep my eye on perceived expectations. I think public process requires us at our level to express a commitment to integrity and openness. So when we get to the voting part of this agenda item, I'm not going to vote. But what I want to do, what I want to do, is, what I want to do, what I want to do, what I want to do, what I want to do. If I, thank you. <laughs> it's like a monster truck event or rock concert echo. I want to move over and just make sure the board members hear me explain the department's view. And in the absence of hearing that from the department, I don't think you will be fully informed in order to make an informed decision. So I, I have a few thoughts, and then I think what you'll have is a presentation by Wildlife Conservation Board staff. <clears throat> also available will be Colin Mills, who's your counsel for the board. I recommend you ask him any question you need. We will also have Nathan Vogley, who's the department's attorney on this project. He's available for any questions you may have. We will have Ed Pert, who's our regional manager, and his staff available for questions, including biological ones. And just so I'm crystal clear about openness and directness and transparency, I haven't spoken to any other board member about this item before right now. So <clears throat> this may feel like an unusual item because there's going to be a difference of opinion and typically, as we've already seen today, the agenda items are, are very forward looking and have a lot of broad consensus. The department wants to tell you, board members, our experience we had back in 2018 and 19 because I think it's important context. But land swaps themselves, land exchanges are not unusual as a matter of precedent. If you look backwards five years, this board has actually approved five, Ash Creek, two in Grizzly Island, one in Smith Neck Creek, and one in Elkhorn Slough. Two of those, Grizzly Island, were the department exchanged 289 acres, excuse me, 278 acres and received 289, transferred 336 and received 226. So the same scale of these exchanges, and neither of those had a conservation easement or a deed restriction on the transferred lands. So back in 2018, and if you've read the record, you've seen the department was very specific with the county of San Diego. We were in the middle of a contentious dispute. Each of the two government entities had strongly held perspectives on how the county's multi-species conservation plan should be managed relative to this underlying original development project. The department expressed its views that the county absolutely should not go around the multi-species conservation plan relative to this housing development project. I stand by those letters, one of which I signed myself, telling the county that if they went outside the rules of that multi-species conservation plan, we would revoke their whole permit for the whole county. So those letters speak for themselves. 
But it's also true in 2018 and 19 that we took a next step, which I think most of the public expects government to do, and that was to try to resolve the intense dispute we had and kind of enter into a, a mediated discussion for dispute resolution. We did that with the county and its different levels of authority and with the developer GDCI. It wasn't easy. Um, certainly it wasn't perfect. And at that moment in time, our analysis at the department was comparing the alternative of the counting moving to approve the original development project, which almost entirely was already entitled for development, except for these parcels, PV1, PV2, and PV3, or trying to move the county into complying with the MSCP, doing an amendment of that plan, and revising the development project for a less impactful project. We believe when we emerged from that discussion in early part of 2019, the project was dramatically reduced, the impacts were less, and we stand by kind of that decision making. I think it's important for you to hear the context we were struggling with in the middle of at that moment, you know, almost 18 months ago. What I would ask you to do as board members is make up your mind, keep an open mind, listen to all the pro and con advocacy you'll get today. That's part of the job. I trust you to make the decision you need to make. You're going to hear some counter arguments. That's totally fine. You're going to hear that the department can't do this because of the California Environmental Quality Act. We think that's not accurate. Our attorney Nathan Vogel is available. I think you'll hear you as a board can't rely on San Diego County's EIR. I think actually CEQA guidelines tell you you rely on the other lead agency's document. I think you'll hear that there's bad data involved. I think you'll hear the land conversion evaluation the department did that's in the record for you is biased. I would ask everyone to take a thoughtful read of that document because what you'll find is it is a straight talk document. We illustrate all the cons of the project involved, all the risks. We identify the risks and we also talk about the benefits and conclude on balance that this revised project through the dispute resolution reduces the edge effects doesn't isolate our properties surrounded on all four sides by housing and roads, improves the habitat corridors, and merges with a better preserved network across the whole regional landscape. If you've read the LCE, you'll see our staff spent a lot of time in it disclosing our thoughts and analyses around Kino Checker Spot Butterfly, pointing out the flaws and the benefits. We think we illustrated both sides of the debate. Kino Checker Spot Butterfly was top of mind for us. I will remind you it's not a state endangered species act species. We have no jurisdiction over it for purposes of the ESA. And it's actually not covered as a covered species under the multi-species conservation plan. You're probably going to hear we're giving up more value than we're getting. You're probably going to hear the underlying project itself will never happen. Again, we in 2018 and 19 were in the middle of an intense dispute weighing alternatives. A reasonable position is the already mostly entitled underlying project will be built, and we were trying to shrink impact and produce a better preserved design. This stuff's never easy. I apologize that you've had a lot of information put to you at the last minute. It's not perfect. I just wanted a chance to explain to you what I lived a year and a half ago. So with that, I'm not going to vote, but I will ask you for your yes vote. 
And let me turn it over to staff for presentation. I'm going to turn off my video and microphone. And Nathan and Ed and Colin are available for you as we go through what might be the next hour or so of debate. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, with that, I will ask Jason Yee of our staff will to present the project to you. Jason? Yeah. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Chuck, for that opening statement. Uh, this project is to consider the exchange of properties between CDFW and GDCI. The exchange properties are located in Proctor Valley, which is one mile northeast of the city of Chula Vista and one mile southwest of the community of Humul in San Diego County. Um, on the map, the proposed project area is highlighted in red and also with diagonal lines. And uh, Jason, I'm not seeing the yes. map. Celeste, have you gone back to the item? Oh, yeah, I yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It should be on there. Are you guys not seeing the the map? Actually, it, it's it's thirty two project thirty two. We see Tehachapi Bear Mountain. So Rancho Homul is up for me. Is it up for you guys? Yeah, it is, it now. is now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The exchange properties are adjacent to nearby or part of the 5,600 acre CDFW Rancho Homul Ecological Reserve. The reserve is an important co component of the San Diego County Multi-Species Conservation Program Subarea Plan. Species that inhabit the reserve include the federally endangered Kino checker spot butterfly, along with the federally threatened coastal California gnat catcher a Western Spadefoot Toad. The reserve is bounded by numerous public ownerships that connect to provide a large core area of conserved lands, including the Bureau of Land Management Ote Mountain Wilderness Area, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, San Diego Sweetwater National Wildlife Refuge, and CDFW's Hollenbeck Canyon Wildlife Area. Next slide, please. This proposed land exchange agreement is consistent with and is a result of a dispute resolution agreement entered into by CDFW, US, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, San Diego County, and GDCI. The parties have agreed to an alternative land development plan that requires this proposed land exchange. The identified CDFW properties for exchange to GDCI involve 219 acres that are part of the Rancho Homul Ecological Reserve originally purchased in 2003 with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Section 6 funds along with WCB matching funds. These properties are now being subjected to this exchange for 339 acres owned by GDCI, along with the 191 acre conservation easement on GDCI land. Um, this map displays the current reserve outline highlighted in green, along with the proposed exchange properties. The blue highlighted properties will be exchanged to CDFW, and the purple highlighted properties will be uh, exchanged to GDCI. Next slide, please. The properties exchanged to CDFW will become part of the reserve, providing a net increase of 311 acres. The result of the exchange for CDFW is a fully viable east-west regional wildlife corridor and a superior preserve design that creates a broader east-west tract of connectivity land, along with the improvement of a north-south conservation corridor. Um, this map shows the result of the exchange with the broader east-west connectivity corridor, along with the improvement of the north-south corridor west of the development footprint, all highlighted in green. Next slide, please. If this exchange does not materialize, San Diego County has approved a current land plan that GDCI can implement. Implementation of the plan would permanently fragment potential habitat connectivity with severe development edge effects on the outlying areas of the current reserve design. The exchange would avoid this permanent fragmentation by allowing for development of CDFW properties exchanged to GDCI, creating a more compact development footprint and significantly reducing the linear edge effects between development and sensitive habitat of the original plan. Uh, this map uh, is a side-by-side -side comparison of the current land plan versus the post land exchange plan. Uh, with the current plan, you can see the widespread development footprint fragmenting the reserve. And with the post plan, a compact footprint that would severely decrease the impacts of development on the reserve. Next slide, please. 
If the change does not occur, G GDCI plans to implement the current plan, which will result in 130 acres of CDFW reserve land becoming surrounded by development. The biological integrity of the current reserve structure would also be expected to greatly decline over time. Next slide, please. CDFW in coordination with WCB has requested that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service authorize this proposed exchange, which is still pending. If U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service concludes that this exchange is warranted, they will respond with specific disposition instructions. The exchange of land will not occur unless U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is approval for the exchange. Next slide, please. This proposed exchange is supported by a land conversion evaluation prepared by CDFW, which concludes that the proposed exchange is biologically superior to that which would result from the implementation of the current land plan. Next slide, please. The GDCI properties were appraised as having a fair market value of 56485000 The CDFW properties were appraised as having a fair market value of $31 million. Per the terms of the exchange agreement, no compensation will be exchanged between CDFW or GDCI for the difference in value. The appraisals covering all properties have been reviewed and approved by the Department of General Services. Next slide, please. Staff recommends approval of this project as proposed. In the audience, representing GDCI are Jim Jackson, Liz Jackson, Rob Cameron, and Dave Hubbard. And from CDFW, South Coast Region is Dave Mayer. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jason. So is there any board member, uh, I think at this time, I'd like to take board member comments and or questions, uh, and then we can engage the department. Uh, yeah. As we I'd say. like to uh, ask a question just for point of clarification. This is Fran Pavley uh, for for the staff and that, their presentation, which I appreciated. Um, in 2003, when a wildlife Jonathan conservation board to make and, a, this a little more brief, what do you think? Um, and actually, who's ever talking right now needs to mute their phone, please. Sorry, Fran. All right. Um, yes, I just wanted to ask a question just after that presentation, just for points of clarification. Um, in 2003, when the Wildlife Conservation Board um, helped fund and matching grant with USFWS, um, the acquisition of the land and and for the, and added it added property to the reserve. What kind of restrictions were tied to the land. I mean, there's some testimony somewhere uh, in letters that it was a permanent protection. And if I just want to clarify that, or is it sub, nothing is permanent and it's subject to perhaps land exchange at a later date? I just wanted to know if there were any restrictions that required that were put on the land when WCB and everyone acquired it. Yeah, there were there were restrictions placed on the property through the federal section six grant. Uh, and the intent was in perpetuity unless. Uh, you know, conditions change and would prompt a project like this. I would like to ask Colin and or John Walsh or Jason to chime in on that as well. Uh, if they have anything else to add. Yeah. Um, and I can leave that question out there that that's just one that I I get sort of the net benefit kind of discussion and argument. But I just wanted to know what that uh, legal language was in there. So it's the intent was to keep it in permanent protection. Um, but there's an unless clause in there unless you can Right, Colin, can you add on sure. to that? Sure, yeah. Uh, under the, the Fish and Wildlife Service Section 6 grant, the the property is to be maintained in its current existing habitat condition um, in perpetuity. Notwithstanding that, there is a process available to recipients of Section 6 to um, what is called, I, I think, a disposal process under the federal standards where the property can be disposed of, i.e. transferred out of ownership. But as part of that process, and what we're doing here is 
we are doing an exchange. So although those lands are no longer going to be in conservation, we are receiving additional lands that will be encumbered with the Section 6 requirements and will be held for habitat conservation purposes. So it's it's a swap in essence. So it's it's technically legally permissible um, if yep. you can prove there's a net benefit. And correct, and and uh, that's the process that Jason referenced in his presentation. That's forthcoming is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is evaluating the exchange. And the exchange will not move forward unless we do have Fish and Wildlife Service approval. And that leads to my final question that could be answered later on too. So if we're waiting for the US Fish and Wildlife Service approval, that's not complete. Uh, otherwise, uh, our approval today won't move forward unless USFWS also approve will approve it at a later date. Why aren't we waiting for them to review all the public comments? Is it relevant to how we might vote on this? I would say two things. I, I would say first, and you know, Chuck or Nathan want to speak to this. Um, we are following a timeline that the parties that entered into the dispute resolution agreed to, to um, take this project forward. Uh, the second thing I would say is, is that the board's approval does not have to wait until the service completes their project. We've identified that the board's approval for the exchange still has an approval waiting. I mean, you could, by way of analogy, I mean, we approve projects when all the, not all the funding is available and they won't close unless all of that funding happens. This is similar to that in that we're approving it to move forward. Once all the approvals are had from Fish and Wildlife Service, then the parties can move forward with closing Vestro on that. Okay, so uh, there was uh, in the dispute resolution agreement, some timeline that is maybe um, bumping up against Yeah, we've, we've actually already um, gone past the timeline that the parties had envisioned. I, I believe the original timeline was for the board to consider this project in May. It wasn't ready for the board's consideration at that time, and, and John opted to move it to August. We've completed everything from a staff level that we believe is necessary to take it forward for your approval and that we su support the board's approval of the project, and we have brought it forward at this time. All right, thank you for the clarification and I'll, I'll wait for the other speakers. Thanks. Thank you, Fran. John, Di John this is Diane. Yes, Diane, please. Yeah. Were you asking for board members questions now or was there going to be further staff presentation? There will be no more staff presentation. Uh, what will happen okay. is that we'll take public comments. But usually we ask Would for board comments before the speakers go, but we can do that the other way too. If you guys would all like to hear speakers first. Well, I have a, I have several questions, which I, I'm prepared to ask now, but there may be additional questions that are sparked by the public comments. So what's your preference? Can I, should I go forward now or? Yeah, go forward now, please. So we can get all the, yeah. All right. And, and the, fir the first one is one that was kind of prompted by, um, by Fran's question and the responses, uh, which which the answer really just dealt with the federal law requirements. But my understanding from uh, reading all the materials that have been provided to us is that there's state law requirements as well under the Public Resources Code, which since the land was put under permanent protection for conservation wildlife habitat purposes, there is a clause in Public Resources Code, Section 5096.516, that would allow an exchange of lands, but the standard is that uh, the lands that are exchanged have to be, if I can find the exact language here, um, have to be uh, conservation lands of greater biological value as wildlife habitat. And so that, so it isn't just the federal 
Fish and Wildlife Service that we're waiting for, we we also have an obligation to make sure that we've met this, the criteria under state law. Is that correct? That's correct. And as um, I, I've detailed in some some memos to the board members, I, I know that some opposition has raised questions about the board's compliance with that public resources code section. It's our opinion right. that we have, and, and we've based that on the department's land conversion evaluation and their subsequent letters that have clarified that evaluation that has determined that we are we are conducting an exchange compliant with the public resources code. Well, then I would just I have a couple other questions I'd like to ask then, and I, I want to preface this by saying that I. I really do um, appreciate all the work that the staff has gone to to get all these have been a lot of documentation, legal analyses, memos that have come in, even including late last night. Um, I spent uh, most of the weekend reading through all this material. So um, uh, and I know it's been a lot of work, especially with COVID and the technology, having to do everything online. And so I appreciate staff's effort to answer our questions and give us all the background material. Um, that being said, it, it still has been a, a lot of information to go through in a very short period of time. And um, I also want to say that I, I, I appreciated Chuck's uh, introductory comments that I, I don't doubt that the, that the Department of Fish and Wildlife folks that went into this dispute resolution process did that in good faith and with the intent of trying to come up with a proposal that would uh, be a win-win, uh, but I still have a number of questions about whether we've really um, met that. And the fir my first question is kind of a two-part one. As I understand uh, from the background information that was provided by staff and from Chuck's comments earlier, it was Department of Fish and Wildlife's position prior to the DRA process that these part these particularly these parcels PV1 and PV3 could not be developed because they were designated as no take conservation lands under the MSCP and that absent an MSCP amendment and absent the developers obtaining the required permits which would be under the department's discretionary authority to grant those would not be able to develop be developed and so my question is one why did you use the current land plan, including the proposed development of those parcels, PV1 and P3, as the baseline for the LCE analysis? And two, why did you include the benefits to be received from protection of PV1 and PV3 in the analysis, if in fact the lands were already protected and weren't subject to development? So that, that's my first question. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to call on unless Colin wants to answer. I would I think it's pro probably appropriate for either Ed Pert and or Nathan to uh, respond to both of those questions, Diane, because okay. the LCE is a department, department document. Dep and yeah, and you know, I didn't I wasn't part of that thinking process when they did that. So I would ask either one of those to, to elaborate a little bit and answer your questions on that. So either Ed and or Nathan. Hi, John. This is Nathan. I'd be happy to answer that question. Thank you. So good afternoon, board members. My name is Nathan Bogley. I'm an assistant chief counsel with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, board member Colburn, uh, as to your first question relative to CFW's <coughs> position on PV1, 2, and 3, and Chuck mentioned this in his opening remarks, we've been very clear that our position has been that PV1, 2, and 3 were preserve under the original MSCP. This was obviously a prime topic of debate between the department and the county, as Chuck indicated. One thing that we've been very consistent about is that in order to do any development on those areas, uh, the county would need to engage with CDFW and go through the appropriate MSCP processes, specifically an amendment to the MSCP to the extent development would be allowed or authorized on that. As to the um, assumption that the lands would be impacted in our evaluation for the land conversion evaluation, at the time the department did the land conversion evaluation, the county had approved the what's called the current land plan, land plan in the WCB documents. So the county had already approved the current land plan to go forward with development. The area, um, with the exception of PV1, 2, and 3, is fully authorized for development under the MSCP already. 
So the vast majority of this project area is authorized for development under the MSCP without an amendment. It, the amendment would be required as to PV 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I appreciate that, though it still seems that in the LCE that the both the impacts to PV1, PV3, if the current land plan went forward, as well as the benefits that would be achieved through protecting them under the DRA, figure very prominently in the analysis. So um, I, I'm still not totally clear on why the department assumed in its LCE evaluation that the that the current land plan in its entirety was a fait accompli if the DRA didn't go forward uh, and was and if the exchange wasn't approved and therefore you had to use it as the baseline. But I, I maybe that's just can't be answered completely. Um, well, I, can, I can I can try and just address that a little bit more. From the department's perspective, and, and we've indicated this, we, we considered the possibility and probability of that land plan going forward with the exception of even PV1, 2, and 3 because it was fully entitled by the county and authorized for development in those areas outside of PV1, 2, and 3 to be the most likely uh, expected future possibility for these lands. And that's why we took as an assumption, and we're very clear in, it, uh, in our land conversion evaluation, the assumption that that project would be going forward as GDCI okay. has indicated. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, my, my second question, again, kind of a two-part question, goes to the biological survey data. And we've kind of had this in a lot of the materials we receive this kind of dueling biologists. Um, and I want to start out at the beginning to say that I, I am sure that the biologists that the developers have working for them and the biologists, um, I think it was um, Jerry Stallcup and the Hamilton uh, folks, that um, that these are biologists that have are well respected, have credibility and experience, and are qualified. So it's it's challenging from the board members' perspectives to you know decipher all of this. Um, so I go back to the, what the department is presenting us in the LCE, and they point out in there that uh, the biological survey efforts were not equal on the lands proposed to be exchanged. So the comparison of the biological data across the different parcels was difficult that an updated inventory of the lands owned by DFW was not possible given to the seasonality and time constraints that were imposed. Um, that they, they did do some very relatively brief site visits in October, December, 2019, but for the most part relied on the um, biological resource surveys that were documented by GDCI in 2016. Though they also add that they were aware of, uh, the department was aware of some biological resources that were present that were not documented in 2016, and that the protocol surveys for the Kino checker spot butterflies were not performed on any of the properties in, in the strong flight years of 27 through 2019. So my question is, and, and I guess because, although I appreciate we've done land exchanges in the past, I don't think we've done very many, if any, where we're exchanging land that was under permanent protection. So I think that that's what's kind of significantly different here. Um, and, and I think because in order to preserve the public trust that when we say we're going to permanently protect something, that uh, we mean what we say, and in, to preserve the, this, the public sense of the integrity of the NCCP and the MSCP process, that we it's a high bar. I mean, I, I agree that we should be able to do land exchanges when it really makes sense for conservation. But I think it, it should be a high bar that we only do it when we're sure that we're meeting this standard in the code of the biologically superior outcome. And so my question is, why, what were these time constraints that were imposed? Who imposed them? And why could we not, given the importance of this and that we want to get it right, why couldn't we take the time to go out and actually do the on-ground biological survey so that we could be basing this on more updated um, information? And maybe I'll just stop there because I don't want to confuse it by adding the second part of my question. I'll just answer that first. And I don't know, Ch John, who you want to have answer that. But. Yeah, I think Nathan, as far as the timing and the okay. CRA, I think it's best for him to opine on that. 
Yeah. So the timing was negotiated um, as part of the dispute resolution agreement. It included timelines, which were available with the dispute resolution going back to June uh, 2019. Um, those timelines were negotiated between the parties. Obviously, you're balancing a lot of different interests and in trying to reach them, but it seemed a reasonable timeline given the information that was available. As far as additional or specific surveys out on the ground, I'd say it's probably generally the case that the CDFW never has as much biological resource information for its lands or for any number of other places when it's providing comments and doing analyses. But what the department does do is rely on the best available scientific information at the time. And in this case, not only were there issues related to the surveys, but we did have our own biologists go out and survey the area, um, not a formal survey, but view the area in order to be able to confirm or address issues that were of potential concern. And that led to uh, some additional information in the land conversion evaluation. Okay. Okay, and then, um, sorry, I had to go outside, <laughs> um, sharing space with other folks here. Um, the analysis also says that, uh, I mean, I guess essentially the summary at the very end, if I'm understanding it correctly, the LCE, it says that, um, let me see, I'm trying to put my notes here. that essentially the, the, the department concluded in the LCE that despite the lower, there's, there's several places in the LCE where they talk about the habitat lands in their current condition on the department owned property being of superior habitat quality to the lands that are in the GDCI. And um, Essentially, they conclude that despite the lower habitat quality of the lands being exchanged, the better preserved design configuration, and I guess the resulting connectivity that they think would be achieved uh, through the proposed land exchange was viewed as biologically superior to what would happen under, under the CLP. Um, but they note also in several places that there's the potential that lands that, so that some of the GDC lands, even though they're of lower habitat quality currently than the lands that would be exchanged, they, they might have the potential to, to become a higher habitat value with more intensive restoration and management. And so my question was, um, if that's the case, why wasn't funding included in the DRA for that intensive management and restoration? And maybe, maybe that was discussed and it's not something you can share. I don't know, but. That's that's probably another question for me, if that's okay, John. Um, yes, please, Nathan. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you're, you're absolutely correct. The, uh, the land conversion evaluation is pretty transparent about the habitat values for the lands relative to what's being exchanged, including the high habitat quality for Kino uh, on uh, the CDFW lands in exchange for the uh, lands from GDCI. Uh, the department tried to be very clear about that and on the on balance, recognizing those differences uh, favored the land exchange as biologically superior because of the great benefits brought by reducing fragmentation, increasing connectivity in wildlife corridors and creating this landscape scale uh, passage for wildlife, which is entirely consistent with the MSCP goals and objectives as well. And, Sorry, I thought so, you were trying so to find the, something. So, oh, okay, so so the issue of uh, of of coming up with a management restoration plan that would upgrade the quality of the habitats being exchanged wasn't that wasn't part of the discussion in the DRA or I can't talk about what was part of the discussion specifically. Okay. What I will say is that the end result was that there was um, provisions in the dispute resolution agreement, specifically in section 3.1.1c, to address issues should the biological equivalency analysis or the appraisal come out um, such that they would be short. So there was discretion on the department's part that should the biological analysis review through the land conversion evaluation show that CDFW wasn't achieving a biologically superior alternative through the exchange. They could negotiate with the parties to try to secure additional property interests. So I just want to make clear that there was discretion involved 
uh, maintained by the department to go back to revisit should that biological uh, equivalency analysis fall short. Okay. Okay, so my final question, then I'll give other people opportunity to uh, ask questions or we can hear from other speakers. Um, the, end of the, the appraisal, um, I, I agree with some of the comments that have been made that I don't think the current law in California requires that we would have to have gotten an independent appraisal review of the appraisal, but I'm just raising the question. I'd like to hear the staff's comments on this as to whether it wouldn't have been prudent to do so. And the reason I ask that is because we're relying on the developer's appraisal and given the difference of opinion over the develop developability of, of particularly PV1 and PV3, it's possible those could have been overvalued in that appraisal. And, and just for the sake of public, again, public transparency, um, I'm just wondering if, if that wouldn't have been uh, something that we should look at in an in independent appraisal review. So, Colin, do you want to take that? Just from the yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. I, you know, the the law doesn't require one in this instance. Um, so so we didn't. I mean, to be frank about that, I, I would say that there were extensive meetings between DGS and the appraiser relative to the appraisal of the property. Some opponents submitted a letter. I believe it was in December of 2019 from an appraisal firm. Um, identifying what they perceive to be issues with the methodology that might be used in appraising the property. WCB staff uh, presented that to DGS, so DGS was fully aware of maybe some of the differing opinions about how to appraise the property and the assumptions that might be made. DGS took that into account. They worked with the appraiser. They had meetings. Uh, revisions I know were done in response to DGS comments or concerns. Uh, ultimately, DGS reviewed and approved it to be consistent with USPAP standards. Uh, DGS also, uh, in essence, concluded that, you know, no matter how you want to value these properties, G GDCI's property will always be worth more than the department-owned lands. So there may be disputes as to what the highest and best use might be or the appraisal methodology, but DGS confirmed for the purposes of establishing that the state is not giving up property of a higher value than it's receiving, they confirm that that is not the case and that the state is receiving property back that's a higher value than it's giving up. And then in addition to the DGS review, the US Fish and Wildlife Service also has to review and approve the appraisal as well to be consistent with the federal standards, which uh, as we discussed earlier, the, the service approval is still pending, but that adds an additional layer of, of review by an independent agency relative to the appraisal. So we complied with the law. We, we feel confident in DGS's ability to review and approve the appraisal. And, and that was the, we conducted this transaction consistent with how we conduct all the WCB transactions. Okay, that, that's all I have for right now. Thanks, John. All right, thank you, Diane. I know Mary had her hand up. She's still on. I know there's uh, Mary Kreisman. I, I'm hoping she's still there. Uh, I know she was potentially had a conflict at one o'clock. Um, she's yeah, there. She's her. speaking, but um, she's muted. She's muted. Mary, okay. can you unmute can you yourself? Un Hello. Yeah, we can't hear her. She's still speaking. I think she's tried to unmute and mute. Are you there, Mary? Uh, does she need to do the star six, Celeste? It's on her laptop. She's uh, she's on the app and she messaged right now in the app that she's muted and I didn't mute her. So 
she needs to unmute herself if possible. And it looks like she's pressed the button, but it, we're not hearing her. Okay. Uh, Mary, can you keep trying to unmute yourself and I'll ask for other board member questions. And then if Mary gets on, I would like folks to uh, let Mary chime in if possible. So any other board member comments at this time or questions? Yeah, this is Alina. I mean, I have um, I have a, a couple questions and um, comments, so. Hi. OK, there's oh, Mary. is that Mary? Is that you? Yes. OK, feel free to go first, Mary, and I'll go after you. Thanks, Alina. Apologies. And um, I'm calling in, so hopefully there won't be an echo with my computer here. Um, I just wanted to say I, I so appreciate the passion and dedication to the department and stakeholders and conservation advocates and, and really trying to get what's best um, for this region. Um, I do just overall want to say I have a deep level of discomfort um, taking action on this right now, given it's 10 after one. Um, we did get a lot of information. Diane just made me look bad with how much homework she had done. I did not get through all the documents that were coming in the last three or four days. I made it through some of them. Um, hats off to Diane for being able to dive in. Um, but I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about moving on this when we're already past our time, haven't really been able to dig in. I'm missing another meeting, but this is so important. And I'm not sure there's much we could have done about that. I know that, you know, the staff tries really hard to think about when and how this stuff comes up um, and making sure we're all staffed and, and, and prepared. Um, I think uh, the, the um, really encouraging thing here is we're rarely in this situation where we're, uh, we're being asked to kind of move forward on something that a lot of our conservation partners and allies um, are opposing. Um, and so I think that's good. This is not some a situation we're in very often, um, but just it, it feels rushed. Um, and it seems like a very big decision given who's on the other side of this. Um, that being said, I, I have asked if there's a chance that we could um, defer this to a, a future meeting. And I want to just hear a little bit um, from staff the different scenarios of what could come out today to understand the impact. So if, if we did bump this to our November meeting um, to get this final kind of review and approval, um, have some time to dig into this a little bit more and really understand what's being said about this project and what we understand about the project. Um, what would that mean if we bump this to November? What's, what's, the, what's the good and the bad of that? What's the result of that? Um, what would it mean if we decided to not approve this project today? Um, we, sh we heard a little bit about that in the presentation, but just want to understand uh, some of those impacts of the decision we need to make today. And then I have just a couple other questions uh, following up on that, but let's start there. Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, from a, a, a WCB staff standpoint, you know, I think there's three options that's available to the board today. One is you approve the project as it's proposed in the agenda. The other is you reject and you deny the proposal and or you defer this to a future meeting. Uh, I would like Nathan Vogley to chime in on the ramifications of a delay and or postponement. You know, I don't know what that means to the dispute resolution agreement process uh, and, the, and then also the county's uh, process in this. So if Nathan can chime in on that, that question, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Um, so basically under the dispute resolution agreement, there were certain timelines set, one of which was uh, placing this item on the WCB agenda. Um, as Colin mentioned, it was originally planned to happen in May, but because things weren't ready, it was moved to this August uh, meeting. Under the dispute resolution agreement, if uh, those timelines aren't met, then the developer GDCI Proctor Valley has the option to terminate the agreement, in which case it would go back to the status quo where you have the approved 
uh, the approval from the county for the specific plan for the current land plan uh, prior to the amendment and the exchange that's being proposed here. So it would be a, the developer's option to terminate that dispute resolution agreement and the uh, amendment that have been submitted by the county and approved by the department uh, would revert back to essentially the status quo prior to those agreements. Mary, this is Chuck and I'm only mentioning a process point because you asked two things that would likely happen in September underneath the detail Nathan just provided would be the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service kind of completing its part of the dispute resolution agreement. And also, I think as we've been open about, uh, some of today's opponents have sued the department about that underlying agreement. And it's possible mid-September you have a court result. So if you talk about postponement, you then end up talking about you know, when, how, how long, that kind of thing. 